Geç test edelim. Selam canlı deyiz. Düğürüz müsünüz arkadaşlar? Geç test edelim. Selam. Please comment if you're here us. Okay, Mr. Elshan says we, he can hear us. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So, sorry we had some uh, problems with the voice. Uh, I'm waiting for Nijat if he can join us. In five minutes. Great. Hello, everybody. Nijat. Nijat is also here. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please comment, everybody, if we can. you can hear us as well, me and Nijat. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the Play Everywhere in Azerbaijan. Today, we will present a number of topics, number of presentations. So basically, I was I firstly want to talk about what is this event? Uh, so TensorFlow Everywhere is a series of global events, and this is run by leads of TensorFlow and machine learning communities. So TensorFlow User Group uh, is a non-profit research community for data science and artificial intelligence and machine learning. So uh, TensorFlow User Group Azerbaijan we have established this uh, community last year. So first of all, uh, we all expect that everyone please follow community guidelines and you respect each other in comment section. So you can ask any questions to our speakers, but also make sure that you don't be crucial. So just just be good to each other. So I'm gonna I'm gonna call Amit Sapajada right now and also ask him brief introduction and welcome everyone. Omit uh, over to you. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I'm also very honored to join your events. Uh, this, this is a very great event. Uh, thanks to TensorFlow Developers Group and TensorFlow User Group at Azerbaijan. Also, IBAR, uh, International, the International Bank of Azerbaijan, which is a sponsor this e event as well. Also, IBATEC Academy. Uh, this is as this is first time in Azerbaijan. We are expecting uh, the, uh, more events like that from you guys here, and we will be great. It will be great if everyone uh, uh, can help us to establish such events in Azerbaijan more. Uh, I don't want to go for an extensive. Uh, uh, talks right now because the, today is a very, uh, very dense uh, event. We will have five hours uh, event and we won't have, unfortunately, dinner break. So as everybody is watching this as from home, then uh, I, I, think, I think they will be, they will, everyone will figure it out how to have his dinner in the same time as well. Uh, we have our motivation is to create a community and uh, establish a lot of uh, uh, a lot of events like this for the whole next year. Our first speaker is Sergey. He's uh, he's joining us from Munich. Uh, do we have him? Uh, I think he should be here. Bijat, do we have him as well? Well, 
Hello, hello. Yeah, I'm definitely here. It's kind of funny to also define what is here those days, right? Because back then, um, in order to be here, I need to be like traveling like with a plane, right? Uh, doing a border control and after I'm kind of in a location. Today I'm here, but I'm here actually in Munich and I'm here at the same time with you in Azerbaijan. So I'm like really looking forward to have this conversation, right? And unfortunately, this conversation is not like a uh, general one, right? So you kind of just like go to me and be like, hey, I like this one or I don't like that one. So we need to find like a different like matters, right? Maybe Twitter, maybe email, maybe comment sections like uh, uh, on YouTube, right? Because those questions are going to be asked like later. With that, um, I just going to switch my uh, a bit of like a test setup to a different camera and uh, I will start slowly my presentation basically. Okay, so hopefully you see everything as it should be, right? Because with those like demo days, you like never know what's actually the case. But let's uh, start, right? So TensorFlow. I guess like many of you, since like you are part of TensorFlow user group, right? You are aware what's happening, right? And like what is it for? So I'm not gonna go like much into um, details explaining you like why do we need TensorFlow. But um, the questions that we're gonna cover today, especially by me being like a first speaker is what is the new things in TensorFlow 2.2? And as you see, like from the index, right, it's been already quite some time um, in a lifetime of TensorFlow. So there's gonna be some things that definitely like making TensorFlow more mature. Um, yeah, but before I jump into this one, like who who is this person talking here, right? So my name is Sergey, right? I'm originally from Ukraine, from Kyiv. Um, currently on, on the last uh, seven, eight years, I'm living in Munich, Germany, and here I'm in love with machine learning. On one hand, I'm organizing machine learning uh, community. This is basically like a meetup with more than 2000 members, like on meetup.com, and we're trying to do like monthly meetups. Um, I'm also a Google developer expert in machine learning. So this is basically like a program that um, Google does some recognition. And after you like working with, uh, you know, with engineers and like maybe sometimes like giving the talks like today or um, doing some open source, right, that they do. Um, I also uh, used to be like VP of product engineering at Stylite, but uh, currently slightly different. And as you can see also, I like colors and a bit of like a different sport. Um, so what we're gonna cover today in the talk. Um, so essentially the conversation today is gonna be around uh, two main blocks, right? One is about uh, model building, how you as a data scientist uh, or machine learning engineer, depending how you would like to call yourself, can build better models, right? Maybe some things that you were not able to do, right? Maybe some conveniences, maybe even different new libraries, right? And another part is how to improve some things that you had before, right? Um, you're already having like a similar pipelines, right? And uh, similar um, routines, right? But you had some issues. And uh, uh, with a new version of TensorFlow, we try to approach those uh, issues, right? And make it a bit uh, convenient for you. So let's start with... Uh, um, like first block, right, with TensorFlow experimental.numpy. Um, if you have been like for long enough, right, you have seen uh, um, this like a different learning curves like of TensorFlow, right? So it was the times when you need to write like really um, row operations with uh, TensorFlow, right? And uh, you define like variables, right? And like what's happening was like really not uh, easy, right? We had also 2.x, right, that made all API way more convenient, right, and easier to use. But uh, even before TensorFlow started, how mature it is like those days, they've been like NumPy, right? And if you've been um, in this market for a while, right, um, you have seen like NumPy kind of like everywhere, right? And uh, it's not really a surprise because like NumPy is actually uh, was founded like in 1995. So it's crazy to say, but it's like 25 years old. That means that there is like a bunch of people who like NumPy, right? They like the interfaces, they're familiar with that, right? There's like a bunch of libraries that use uh, NumPy arrays, right? And they can benefit of that. Um, but that was like a bit of like a hard, um, yeah, hard to make a bridge between like TensorFlow NumPy and this like entire ecosystem. That's why we have TensorFlow NumPy, right? So what's actually happening there, right? And like, why do we need that? So TensorFlow uh, NumPy or experimental NumPy or NumPy on TensorFlow, right, is basically implementation of subset of uh, NumPy operations, right? That can be run on CPU, GPU, TPU, right? And also using TensorFlow runtime. Well, what does it mean, right? On one hand, it means that um, you have all the good like benefits of TensorFlow, like up to diffing, right? And uh, getting gradients and everything else, but with all the interfaces of NumPy. So if you're coming from, I don't know, from academia or you haven't seen like TensorFlow, I don't know where did you live before, right? <laughs> but it, it might be like a good um, 
good way for you to hack and like build some things, right? And uh, what we add like on top, right, is basically that you can combine it with already existing TensorFlow, right? So TensorFlow dataset, TensorFlow signal, Keras, you can distribute this load across like a different uh, compute nodes as well. And everything is kind of like uh, working out of the box. Um, all of those things that I'm going to be mentioning here, um, they all also available like in a guys tutorials or I don't know, just approach me on Twitter later on and they can find you a bit more information around this one. So let's get a bit more into details. How can you use this one? Is it complicated? Not really, right? I mean, you need to install uh, TensorFlow version like 2.4 or TF Nightly. Um, it also should uh, have it inside. And after it's basically, if you import it, um, it's going to be having like very similar interface as you would use like a NumPy, right? So for instance, NumPy has a um, random variable, right? Normally distributed and you can basically do the same, right? Um, on this uh, line of the code. Let me just see if I kind of put a pointer. Yeah. So you basically use like very familiar from NumPy interface. And after you can say like, hey, uh, what device is that, right? And surprise, surprise, it's already like allocated to GPU. So if you you know, run some operations, those operations also going to be executed on GPU. So that means that it's going to be faster. And as I said in the beginning, you're getting all of those like a huge um, uh, set of the libraries, huge number of the libraries as your favorite matplotlib, for instance, that you can just like get this X that we got, right? And plot it, right? There is like no need to do like dot numpy as before, right? There is like no need to do all of those additional lines of the code, right? That you were able to do before. Now it's way more convenient. And as I said, it's not only about making it more convenient, but it's actually about performance. So how can you read this graph? Um, on y-axis, you basically see like a time in milliseconds to execute it. Um, in um, yeah, on x-axis, you basically see how big is the size of the page, right? We're starting from something smaller and we're getting to something bigger. And in terms of lines, right, you're getting like a numpy that is like this blue, um, blue line basically that uh, doesn't really, as you see here, like scale is that good. You have like TensorFlow NumPy is that running like just on CPU. Um, there is like compiled version. I will get like into details like in, in a few slides and uh, uh, TF NumPy like on GPU, right? So um, I guess like I don't need to explain like that much, but you can already see that uh, even TensorFlow like NumPy on CPU, right, is performing like better for those like benchmark. Obviously benchmark is called benchmark for reason, right? It doesn't really like cover all possible use cases. And it might be that some of the operations that you are using are not implemented, but there is like still quite a bunch of ops, right? That are already implemented in TF NumPy. And there you're getting this like a benefit. Um, yeah, so like how does it work and why do we get those results? So with uh, TF NumPy on CPU, I would uh, um, just like start uh, from uh, um, explaining like where is this one coming from, right? Um, and the idea being that uh, uh, TensorFlow is like on the one hand optimized like some parts, right? But also TensorFlow NumPy uh, on CPU is actually multi-threaded kernels. So using multi-threaded kernels. So there you basically can um, get this performance uh, um, quite a bit like faster than like another side. Um, and TensorFlow NumPy GPU in this case like can be, um, this graph is around like seven times like faster than um, like another version. So let's get uh, a bit like into examples how it can be used. So do you remember our old friend, uh, um, you know, this uh, randomly, like normally distributed random variable, right? Um, you can again create it as example here, or you have it somewhere like from data set or from other places where you got your uh, um, NumPy array, right? And after it has like all interfaces of uh, normal TensorFlow tensors, right? So you can do, you can create a data set that um, you initializing like from tensor slices and you can say like, hey, you know, like do some operations like on mapping, right? And for those of you who are not familiar with TF data set, this is like a very neat abstraction that allowing you to um, have this uh, operations like on your data set, like mapping, like batching, like shuffling, like and stuff like that. So if you don't use it, definitely take a look like a TF data set. But now you're also aware that you can use it with TF NumPy. Um, yeah, if you have been around like for TF 2.x or you played around, you're aware that um, you can use uh, as a context uh, TF uh, gradient tape, right? That means that uh, um, if you do like operations, right? Gradient tape gonna write basically those operations um, on the graph, right? On the tape, right? And uh, if you would need to 
basically execute. Let's say here we're getting those inputs right from data set. You're getting like one by one essentially, and you can uh, get the gradients right from those inputs with respect to weights, right? So um, that's basically how you would uh, um, use it. And as you see, this is like very familiar story from um, like normal TensorFlow 2.x, but in reality, you still using like operations that are so familiar from NumPy, right? So it's the same like a dot product, right? The same like exponential uh, things, right? Or just like a sum, right? Those are like just like a normal um, NumPy operations, but they like working with all performance and all infrastructure with uh, of TensorFlow. So what else can we do? We can make it faster, right? And as I said, all of operations um, of TensorFlow, they're also available. So for instance, you can um, replace like our own definition of like sigmoid, right? With a numerically stable um, sigmoid, right? And also more optimized. Um, the same you can say, hey, I don't want to do it like, sorry for my noises, we still have pandemics. Um, yes, we still can basically say, hey, I don't want to do it uh, one by one. I would like to use like map functions that would do basically the same um, for each element in the batch, right? So, um, okay, it's like faster. You can use basically TensorFlow together with like NumPy and interview it like with one to another. Can you make it like faster actually? And how you can do this like compiled uh, as I showed like in a benchmark? It's actually also pretty similar and rhymes with uh, um, TensorFlow 2.x way of doing things, right? You defining it with a wrapper that, hey, it's going to be TF function. And from there, you basically would have this uh, part um, compiled, right, in like a tiny graph. And this graph is going to be like highly optimized. Um, and what you basically can do as well, additionally to compiling the code, right, you can do after vectorization. Um, it's basically the same functions that you used before with uh, um, map function, but you can say vectorized map, right? And this is going to be also um, optimized for you, right, into more vectorized representation of this. Uh, what performance do we get? Like, does it even make sense to do? Because it sounds fancy, but what is the point? Here is basically like line uh, or graph basically showing how this is going to change the performance. So original um, is going to be like a blue line, right? We have iterative approach where we just like applying this like a map um, to every, um, every input essentially, right? Once we compile it, right, you're already getting quite a bunch of like a benefit, right? This is the difference between like a blue line and orange line. Um, and if you vectorize it and compile, you're already getting this like performance that could be, um, you know, if you run it like on GPU, right, by a factor of 100 or so. So it's not only convenient, right, but it's also like pretty fast and good. Um, although like one can say that also if you don't use like a NumPy and just use like a code written in the TensorFlow 2.x, right? You still can do all those things, right? I mean, you can still like do it your function, right? You can still um, do like some optimizations to get pretty good performance. So this is like more as a reference for getting like a NumPy and uh, getting like results out of this one. Um, so what else is there? Is it like all done deal, right? Or is there like anything like still left, right? So on one hand, um, those uh, NumPy arrays, they are constants, right? So you cannot really like uh, mutate them in place as like a normal uh, NumPy would allow you to do. So this is like something that team is um, thinking about, right? Um, there is also possibility to support like more ops, right? Or operations um, are there. Um, they can also be like working on TensorFlow runtime, right? To uh, improve operation dispatch basically. And um, a bit more like API for distributions, right? Because uh, currently it's also like with TF distribute, right? And you can say like, hey, is it like a multiple GPUs, right? Or GPU, whatever you would like to. And uh, you can make it like more flexible essentially. And uh, at the end of the day is basically all of those uh, um, NumPy libraries, right, as trucks or scikit-learn, they can be using also TF NumPy. So if you also developer of uh, some of the libraries that using like NumPy in the background, you can also take a look like how um, hard would it be or if you see some any problems, it's actually transitioning it to TF NumPy. And if you find some issues, right, please write to us like on um, GitHub, right, or I don't know, like any other channels, and we would be able to take a look like at those. Um, and again, there is like a guide with TF NumPy on tensorflow.org slash guide TF NumPy, and you can play around with the things like in a collab, right, and see how you like it. Okay, so this was like a bit more for people who started a bit early right with machine learning and like really played around with like uh, numpy now we're going to be talking a bit more like uh, with keras preprocessing right i have a feeling that keras is just like very um i mean i, I don't have a feeling like i definitely like a very that is like very friendly uh, api layer right it's also why it was um adopted like as a primary layer for tensorflow um and for those of you who actively using uh, keras right um maybe you also had a bit of like feeling 
when there were also like estimators, right? And estimators were not as like concise and elegant as Keras, right? But they definitely had their own uh, value, right? For instance, you can pack pre-processing, right? Or input function very nicely, right? And after carry it around, like for your serving, right? With Keras, unfortunately, if you have seen it, it's not that easy, right? So if you're building like a model to classify text, right? Or even images, you need to carry around with you like, hey, how you do like tokenization, what did you vectorization and all those things, right? Now imagine that you need to deploy it like on mobile, right? Or even like inference with, uh, um, I don't know, like on some like remote server, right? You again need to figure out like, hey, what language are you using for that, right? Is it Kotlin? Is it Scala? Is it something else, right? How to build the same like pre-processing that you use like for training, right? How to ensure that, you know, like it doesn't break, right? And you don't miss like some uh, small errors, right? So there is like quite a bunch of potential when one can make like error, right? And uh, um, the story being simple, right? If there is a potential to make error, right? It's not question of like if, right? But more question of when, right? And somebody would definitely make this problem and the error at some point. So Keras preprocessing is trying to make it, um, you know, like more reliable and more error prone, right? So essentially saying, hey, wouldn't it be cool, right? To actually build preprocessing as a part of the model, right? And if it's a part of the model, it means that once we do like, um, you know, like model save or save model like export, you would have it like as a part of the graph, right? And after once you do like TF flight, right? You're basically getting the same preprocessing layers like everywhere, and uh, you don't need to kind of like carry it around. Does that sound cool? I think in the audience you would be like, "Hey, it's pretty amazing, right?" Or not so much. Uh, but now I just like believe that you like it. Um, yeah. So let's see. Um, how how does it look? Is it like complicated? Not really, right? I mean, it's actually like, uh, it looks how it sounds essentially. So for instance, if you do some NLP stuff, right? And we would like to vectorize our text, right? They're gonna be like in TF, um, Keras uh, preprocessing, there's like a bunch of different preprocessing functions. One of them is basically like text vectorization. And you can basically say like, hey, I would like to vectorize my text, right? I would like to have basically output uh, in int, right? So essentially you don't do like one hot encoding, but um, more like it's getting like, you know, like number for um, every um, yeah, encoded uh, uh, word, right? And there's like a bunch of different ones as well, right? You can do uh, like hashes, right? You can do like a bucketization, you can do all kinds of things around that. Um, so what you usually do, right? I mean, usually you need to understand like, hey, um, you know, like my vectorizers, right? It was uh, um, trained like on a training data set, right? And after you're gonna use it like for inference, right? And that's basically what you do here. You adapting your vectorizer layer, right? To your train text, right? And while doing that, right? You're getting this like internal representation of this like vectorizer that's gonna be embedded inside of the layer. Um, and from there is basically pretty easy to use. Um, so you basically say like, hey, you know, you do like a normal sequential layer or you do like functional uh, approach, like it doesn't really matter, it's just for the sake of simplicity. And you're saying like, hey, I would like to reuse the same vectorizer here, right? That's pretty simple as it is. And uh, if you say that, hey, but like, how how do I know like how vectorizer actually works, right? Um, if you go to, you know, like uh, I will have like links as well, but if you go to like API documentation there, there's quite a bunch of different uh, um, arguments and uh, options how you can be using like vectorizers. There is like how you would like to split, right? There is like how you would like to, um, um, yeah, like normalize things or standardize, right? Or if you do like a lower or upper or whatever else, there's like quite a bunch of like potential, right? But now um, all of this like vectorizer layer, right? is going to be like a part of your model itself, right? So once you like export it, right? It's going to be like a part of uh, the same export, yeah. So if you save it, right, as I already said, um, Sorry for my, yes. If you export it, right, you're gonna, or save a model, you would have it like as a part of the graph. Um, now imagine if you're coming from more like images, right? And uh, all of us are, before we try and uh, start to train like on those images, we do some rescaling, right? Depending like on what baseline we are using for feature extraction. And here you can basically say that, hey, rescaling is basically like a part of the story, right? It's a part of the model itself, right? So it's basically the same, you do like layers, experimental preprocessing, like uh, rescaling, you say that, hey, how you would like to, um, yeah, to rescale it and uh, what, uh, yeah, like this is basically like a normal stuff, like for um, input uh, node of your sequential layer. Uh, if you print this model with like model summary, you also get information on, um, yeah, like on the layer, right? And it's basically showing like as a normal layer inside of that. Um, and as you can see here, it's also using like zero parameters. 
why is that? Because there's like nothing that we need to learn here, right? It's basically like pretty simple and uh, we know why we were scaling, right? And there is like nothing happening like during like a backdrop and during the training. Can we do something cooler? Yes, we actually can. So one of potential is actually do data augmentation as a part of um, model definition as well. Um, and one can like ask like, but like, why? I mean, like, uh, I kind of uh, do all the things like <laughs> beforehand, right, in my pre-processing. And uh, as much as, you know, pre-processing is something that goes to the inference, right, but um, all of this like data augmentation doesn't go to the inference, right? So like, what is the point, right? And one of the potential benefits, right, is if you have like um, a huge, I don't know, like uh, underutilized basically like your GPUs or your uh, TPUs, right, and you would like to actually do this one uh, maybe more dynamically, right, maybe basically uh, closer to, you know, like to actual compute, right, and you can embed it inside of like your own GPU. Um, but it has also like your other side as well. If you feel that uh, your GPU is already like a bottlenecking, right, adding like more operations to this one would be like maybe not the best way, right? So I'm going to come back to this one to profiling a bit like later, but this is like something that you need to be like really um, mindful of, right? And just like don't go like randomly. I mean, for experiments, it's completely fine, right? You just like run it and you get some information. Uh, but for more production use cases, like try to figure out where is your bottleneck, right? With profiler that I'm going to show like a bit later and after basically use a tool to solve the problem. So how can we use it again? Um, as everything that uh, as Keras model, you can basically embed it inside of like your own uh, like other model, right? So essentially here, we define like uh, data augmentation that has you know random flip, uh, random rotation, like and zoom. Um, and after we saying like, hey, before I basically using it, um, yeah, like before I, uh, pre processing, right? I would like to do like augmentation, right? And uh, um, things are kind of like used. For those of you who currently be like wait a second, but does it mean that they're gonna like uh, flip and uh, zoom also like during the inference? Um, no, not really, right? I mean, it's not the first time that we're seeing the layer that behaving like differently during the training and during the inference. So for instance, like our famous uh, old friend uh, Dropout basically does the same. Depending like on the mode of the network, right? Is it either like in a training mode or is it like an inference mode or running mode, right? Um, you basically get like a different behavior, right? And here is the same story, right? If, um, you know, Keras is basically seeing that it's not like training, it's basically just passing along the value. So like nothing to be like really worried about. Yeah, so what are we getting like as a result out of this one? So on one hand, um, we're basically getting uh, um, quite a bit of like standardization um, out of the box, right? So you don't need to um, think about like, hey, how do I take it away, right? What are the problems? And what is even more helpful, right? You can actually implement your own pre-processing logic, right? Um, simply by subclassing like one of those layers, right? Uh, and subclassing is basically something that was has been like around for quite a bit, right? But uh, there also should be like some examples like in, uh, I guess like in the guides, right? How you can uh, create your own pre-processing logic, right? As a result, hopefully you kind of becoming this like a happy place, right? Where um, you're, distribution of your model, right, it's also becoming like easier. So we're not only focusing on getting like artifact, but we're actually focusing on training that. Um, and as I said, uh, all of those things that I'm mentioning here, you can find them either like on keras.io, right, or tensorflow.org. So there's like tutor uh, tutorials like on image classifications that are already using like new preprocessing, and the same goes like for text classifications that a bit more verbose, right? Um, what is also interesting is that it's not only about, you know, image and text, right, but also your um, very common uh, task of structured data classification is also can benefit of that, right? So um, there's some, some layers and do like a categorical encoding, right? And like other things that you anyway would have to do like every time. Yeah, so this is basically like more about uh, general, um, you know, TensorFlow actually things that like help you to improve what you're building there, right? And now we're gonna go a bit more into what else is like possible there. So if you're working for some company, right? Uh, and this company having like, online users or online presence at some point you will be like hey you know like it's kind of cool that we can do like classification right let's say like in a case of stylite we do a classification of you know like tens of millions of the products right when they're coming into the platform and we would like to know is it a dress right is it a, i don't know the shoe what type of the shoe what uh, i don't know what colors they're having what occasions and stuff like that right but this is like only first layer right once you have a bit more information about users right 
or you like become a bit of like a Netflix, right? That you see like really recurring behavior of the users like coming back to your platform, you would like to also recommend it, right? Um, recommend something like that more relevant, right? And makes us, uh, um, you know, like uh, attendance like of your website is like a good uh, good event, right? Or your mobile app, it doesn't really matter. Um, and before, and I mean, there are currently like uh, quite some libraries that can help you out, right? As, I don't know, like uh, you can use some metrics authorization to just do the things, but uh, how can you do it uh, better or like differently with TensorFlow? I wouldn't say it's like better. It depends like on your problem, right? So don't don't be like everything TensorFlow, right? Think like what is the problem and after try to apply the right tool for the things. So TensorFlow Recommenders is like a new library, right? Um, that basically allowing you in comparison uh, or yeah, like uh, in comparison to traditional approaches, right? Like metrics authorization that I already mentioned, um, use the contextual information of users and items, right? So for instance, maybe you're recommending, I don't know, like fashion items, right? Uh, or maybe you're recommending like cars, right? And you would like to not only use uh, um, some, you know, categorical features, like what type of the car, right? But you actually would like to use like images itself, right? Or you have some like behavioral data and you would like to use it, right? And this normal micro authorization, right? is kind of like, I mean, this is not what it's uh, for, right? Obviously, but even for item-based like recommendation, right? You still need to figure out how to get this like context, right? Uh, but the TensorFlow is like what we did like for ages, right? You can get behavioral data, right? You can uh, get, you know, like some old, old type of like unstructured data and just use it from there. Um, yeah, and all of this is basically built on uh, TensorFlow like 2.0 or like 2.x in general, and uh, also integrates this entire ecosystem for training, serving, like on all of the pieces that you already would like to have. So how would it like, uh, how it would look like basically? Sorry for um, saying this way. So at the end of the day, basically, you can uh, have this like example that uh, is called uh, um, like a uh, two tower architecture, right? Um, we can have like one tower for, uh, you know, that models like a user and another one that um, like models like a movie and uh, they all combine like on this uh, um, score that is like user item, right? Or essentially uh, you can have you know, like something that like representing like what request you're getting right if you you know like searching for something right and you're getting uh you search like as a, a recommendation task or ranking task right and after you're basically getting a representation of the features and uh, you're training them together so um how would it look like i mean your general tensorflow data set right and you're getting like recommenders um you also can define basically those um yeah like models that uh, um yeah like extracting this context or information uh, out of uh, each part, right? And there is like a normal Keras layers, right? In this case, they are pretty simple for the sake of uh, uh, example. But, um, you know, if you're using like images, right? You can, again, like reuse some of your own like rest nets, right? And just like do whatever you have to do, right? Just like to get like the best performance out of that. Um, what is slightly different, right? Is like how you're defining some model, right? And I wouldn't go like too much into the details, just like go to a uh, website and uh, um, there's like a good call-up notebooks, right? That's showing you how to how to do those things. Yeah, but essentially uh, for those like two tower examples, right? Um, you can define your um, user model, right? You can define your uh, movie model. You can also define what task you're getting there, right? And the task is basically, hey, what objective I am trying to get out of that, right? Um, and what is also helpful, you can potentially do something very similar with uh, uh, row TensorFlow, right? Because it's like flexible enough to uh, allow you to do the things, right? But there is like a bunch of primitives that are already like implemented. As for instance, you can do like a top K, like as a metric, right? And after it's gonna be trying to uh, understand like, hey, the data that I'm getting like from model, right? Like, is this like in top K, right? Or not, right? And uh, um, you're like able to evaluate the same performance like for, I like, guess for normal um, information retrieval task of recommendation. Um, yeah, and uh, from there on is basically your own Keras, right? You're defining like your uh, optimizer, right? You're like fitting it like with uh, the batches, right? That uh, having the ratings between users and movies, right? And uh, you also can evaluate it. So um, you definitely need to spend a bit more time like to get familiar with this like setup of the model, right? Because it's not like your um, generic, I don't know, classification problem, right? But uh, once you have familiar familiarity, right? You can again, reuse all of your knowledge, right? Of using, uh, you know, Keras, right? And uh, what I just like showed you with pre-processing, right? And the uh, TF NumPy to actually apply it for completing your task of uh, 
problems and possibilities that you have. So in order to find it, just go like tensorflow.org slash recommenders. And there's like tutorial guides, right? And the uh, um, GitHub organization of recommenders is also pretty active. So if you have any problems, issues or whatever else, right? Just like, um, yeah, just come back there. Don't go there for questions, right? Because sometimes these questions is a bit of like harder, start with Stack Overflow or um, other places. But if you find something that is like not working the way it's intended, this is like a good uh, place to be. Um, yeah, so what else is there new, right? On one hand, uh, as we already talked like about bottlenecks, right? Uh, sometimes your bottleneck can be coming like from, um, for compute, right? But uh, if you were like lucky enough with the Moore's law, right? And the companies investing like in GPU and TPU, right? That um, recently that wasn't the case, right? Um, they've been like a different generations of like uh, uh, TPU ports, right? There is like GPUs getting released like every year that are faster, like and um, do like uh, better and better work, right? So um, we were like lucky with this part, right? But you still need to feed all this like data to your models, right? And sometimes it means that, um, yeah, it's kind of becoming the bottleneck, right? Because if your CPU is basically, or sorry, like CPU, for if your TPU or GPU is waiting for the next patch, right? It's becoming a bottleneck, right? So it can be computing something, right? But it's like waiting for data to come in. So how can you do it, right? For those of you um, who just like use like a normal uh, data set, right? Um, there is like a few reminders of your TensorFlow data set, uh, how you can um, improve it, right? And this is like not um, nothing new, right? It's something that has been like around for quite a while. Yeah, but uh, what you can do is basically do a TF data data set prefetch that basically would say, hey, I would like to, um, pre-compute some things right beforehand, right? So it could be is that, I don't know, like let's say you have something like a model that is like really um, like verbose, right? And it takes quite a bit of time um, to compute, right? But um, your pre-processing is also like complicated, right? In in the worst case scenario, right? You almost like do it like one by one, right? So first you're basically doing uh, pre-processing takes like a while, right? And after you like offload into GPU, right? It takes a while, right? And you do it again and again, right? But essentially it means that, well, one is working, right? Another one is like waiting and stuff like that. So what you can do is basically say, hey, data set like prefetch it, right? And after it's gonna be like prefetching and pre-computing some stuff like beforehand, or you can cache it, right? You can also cache your data set in memory or to a file so that like once something like was computed, right? You can, um, you know, like have it uh, cached so you need to do it like a second time. Um, yeah, like if you hear it like first time and you would like to get like more information, there is like a guides on optimizing pipeline performance and also how to use like the uh, TF profiler because you need to kind of like understand like what's actually happening and uh, where do you see the problems. Um, what is new uh, is basically being able to create like a snapshot um, and also TF uh, data service, right? And the uh, service is basically about scaling all of those um, CPU workers, right? And snapshot is basically about saving pre-processed like version. But how does it look like? Yeah, so how does it look like? Essentially, you have like a data set, right? And um, your data set can basically check, hey, was this like compute before? If it was computed right, you just get it like from a snapshot. If not, you basically write it to the disk and like give it along, right? Um, this is like how TensorFlow data set would just basically defined, right? I did mention it already like in the beginning, right? So you're defining like a data set, right? You're saying like, hey, do this like pre-processing function that I would like to run. And after you do like your general, um, you know, um, batching and prefetching and stuff like that, right? What you can do is basically after you did um, all of the heavy pre-processing, right? You can say, hey, store it to the snapshot to the directory, right? Um, and what's gonna be happening is basically um, you gotta save it like in, um, like a format that is optimized for reading like faster, right? And you don't need to kind of like rerun it every time when you're getting some information out of that. Uh, before this like was so easy with a snapshot, I guess like many of you did, or at least like I did, uh, I just would have like a few different uh, stages for work with my data set, right? And I would like manually write like TF record after I did this like steps, right? Um, but it's definitely like easier to just like add one line, right? That just like have another step like in your pipelines that is harder. Um, yeah, and what is TF data service? This is basically a problem when I'm saying that, hey, maybe you're using some uh, pre-processing that is like pretty complicated, right? Or your data is like really uh, verbose, right? And uh, usually you would have like one, 
heavy um beefy like cpu that does everything for you but sometimes like it doesn't really work right because you need to have like more throughput out of your pre-processing and there you can define like hey you have like tf data like service right and after this service is going to have like a distributed pool of workers that's going to pre-process things for you right so how does it look like it's basically you know our old friend from before and after you're saying like, hey, I would like to distribute my uh, data set like over all those workers, right? Um, small catch here, right? Um, is basically once you have this like line TF distribute, right? But what operation is going to be like distributed, right? It's not like the ones that go in like after, right? But everything that goes like before, right? So like all of this like batching mapping, everything else is going to be uh, you know distributed. You so you can think like, hey collect me, um, you know, like a shopping list, what should be done and now redistributed across all of those um, distributed like workers that are going to be doing that. Yeah. So um, for this data service, there is like a repository of uh, ecosystem um, data service, right? And uh, you can also look at, uh, yeah, like a bit API docs, how to make your own um, setup like working well. Yeah, as a result, basically, we improving uh, all of uh, pre-processing, right? We taking care of the bottlenecks, right? And hopefully, we're getting like a better machine learning life, right? And <laughs> Snapshot, as I said, can reuse, like help us to reuse basically just like pre-processing. So uh, yeah, hopefully, you can uh, um, make it raining like faster and uh, you can validate like more different ideas. Yeah, and as I said, um, there is normal uh, guide for data performance, right? It's like been around for a while. And there's like a data performance analysis. It's like a new developer guide. Let's take a look and uh, hopefully find something cool. And last but not least, I very shortly gonna go through uh, TensorFlow Profiler. Um, TensorFlow Profile, I've been like um, around for a while, um, but there's like also some optimizations. Like one of optimizations or improvements is basically being able to see um, memory timeline graph, right? And the idea of that, like, I mean, if it's going to be like on the audience, they're going to ask like, hey, who of you had this issue when like your model is like running like uh, with uh, uh, or failing like with out of memory <laughs> issue? And I've seen, I've definitely would imagine it's like quite a bunch of you be like, hey, like I had this issue, right? Because it's it's kind of like happening pretty um, frequently once you start using like a bigger models, right? So how can you use this graph? Is on one hand, try to understand like how much, um, you know, free memory you having, right? Uh, how much heap is basically of yours? Um, is decreasing, right, um, and increasing as well. And also what is really interesting, like what is fragmentation, right? What memory is that is um, kind of like can be used, right, but it's like defragmented, right? And um, I mean, it's like it's not uh, like usable basically. And after you can try to understand if it's like really on the peak performance, um, you have some problems like with your memory, right? And you need to have more or it's more like fragmentation problem, right? And after you need to uh, have some issues like with, uh, yeah, like memory allocation and you can basically improve and see where is it coming from. It's not really like as straightforward as like using pre-processing, but once you uh, have a bit of like, um, I don't know, familiarity for yourself, right? You definitely would get uh, more uh, understanding there. Yes, and this is like how it usually looks like, right? Uh, you will be able to see what um, different, you know, like um, operations are working, right? And uh, in some cases, like where um, this like memory is growing like the most, right? Um, I wouldn't go like a bit more in detail like on this slide, but there's like definitely like uh, entire guide, right? That you can follow it step by step. And additionally, I think there should have been like uh, videos from previous uh, TF Dev summits that they show in a bit more like in details. So uh, don't be afraid of like so many, um, yeah, like, <laughs> lines and colors here it's just like you know you can hover the things right you can uh, um, click on them and you will be able to understand like what's actually happening there um there is also a bit of um improvements or like on the tracing level right so on one hand the trace viewer can now uh show up like up to one million events right so if you're like running for longer right and you would like to see like more events and you can also define um what uh, trace level you would like to have right so it's like device level host level or even like enable back like a Python trace level. So it has a bit of like more flexibility to do it. Um, yeah, so that's been basically a bit of like a wrap. And obviously this is like not what what is new like in TensorFlow ecosystem, right? It's more like in TensorFlow core, right? And like a part of them because there are gonna be still the talk of like uh, from Jason about uh, TensorFlow JS, right? And from uh, Josh, uh, I think like about some other aspects of that, right? So it's only like, TensorFlow core, right, and things like inside of like a TensorFlow. So just to um, wrap it up again and uh, 
remind you what topics you can take a look like once you are done <laughs> with this presentation is basically a TF experimental NumPy, allowing you, allowing you basically to run your NumPy code faster and like more convenient and like interbuild with like a, a TensorFlow code. TensorFlow so, uh, Keras preprocessing layers, right? That allowing you to embed the preprocessing inside of the layers to make it like easier to redistribute and recommend this library, right? So it's like better. Plus uh, how to work better with your data service and everything else. Um, with that, I am done. You can um, follow my updates like on Twitter. Uh, you can look basically at tutorials and guides like on TensorFlow website. There is also like a blog, YouTube, and uh, uh, Keras.io. So with that, mm -hmm. I'm kind of coming back to um, to the questions. If you had some, maybe yes. we don't have like a lot of time. Thank you. It's really we'll great try. presentation and great slides. We have learned a lot of things from you, and uh, thank you. So we have some questions, and I would like to, I would like to give it. Uh, Elshan, I'll ask it that what can we ex in TensorFlow 2.5? Yeah, so some of the things that uh, um, I already mentioned um, in terms of you know improvements for TF NumPy, right? Um, there is also, I guess, that should have been like a draft for uh, TensorFlow 2.5, like on GitHub. So just like a sneaky answer for this one, sometimes like, you know, uh, version release, right? It's happening like way later when becoming like a version draft, right? So if you just like a follow up changes like on GitHub, right, you can already see like development, right? And you can already see like quite a bunch of like smaller topics, right? So um, yeah, just like take a look and uh, you will find something. I, I wouldn't have like anything like on top of my mind that something is like really huge, um, but uh, maybe I will tweet it a bit like later. So the uh, next question is that what do you think is missing in TensorFlow? Which features do you wish and think would yeah. be yeah, that's actually, yeah, it's very like good question. Um, I have a feeling that sometimes like, you know, especially me coming like from product engineering background, right, of building products, if you only, what you do is basically adding features, right? At some point it's becoming this like a huge like Frankenstein of like everything kind of the same place. So I have a feeling that, uh, you know, Stansoflow have been like around for um, quite some time already, right? Sometimes it's almost like you need to, uh, be like careful of not really adding like too much, right? And, uh, um, and like what that what we see like with uh, rewriting with TensorFlow one point x to two point x, right? It made things like way simpler, especially for the beginners. And just like adding things like on top of the yeah. core, especially it did show that it has like quite a bit of like hidden cost, right? Of uh, how hard is it like to onboard developers? How hard is it like to think things to uh, uh, test things, right? So now TensorFlow is a bit of going in the direction of you know, modelizing like into smaller pieces, right? What uh, Martin Vick has kind of like started quite a bit of like TensorFlow runtime and everything else. So I wouldn't like try to add things like more on top of TensorFlow, right? Something that would definitely help me, right? Is um, get a bit more visibility what is going to be maintained like in a couple of years, right? But because the domain is like so quickly developed, right? It's actually hard to understand what's going to be like popular in a couple of years, right? So it's a bit of what TensorFlow as a team has a struggle with, right? So you see all those like huge development of like machine learning that is like changing like every day, but they still need to be like reliable and uh, fast uh, and uh, stable API basically. So, um, yeah. Thank you so much. So our next just a few questions. What things we have regarding to TF gradient tape if we have if we are using TF in? Uh as I'm aware, there is like nothing that you need to like do in terms of the changes, right? It's more like how your code can be executed, right? And without using uh TensorFlow function, right? Um you basically I guess it's about TensorFlow function, yeah. Uh, if you're using TensorFlow function, right, you would um compile this like code like in a tiny graph, right? And after it's like more optimized to like reuse it. And if you don't use it, right, it's basically um, going to be having, you know, like to execute like every instruction like separate like every time, right? So it's just going to be like slower. But like on top of my mind, I don't have like any strong like limitations like what you cannot do with a static graph, right? I mean, in the past, they're going to be a bit more issues with like control flow, right? As something that you cannot really compile like to the graph, right? But you can do like a bit more in, um, like a, um, an interactive, interactive mode, right? But I think now a bunch of them should be like resolved, right? And you can also do the control flow. If you see something that is like missing, just like tweet at me and we can take a look. Yeah, thank you. So I think uh, that's all. And thanks again, great presentation. Would like to listen from you in our next uh, events as well.
So thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Unfortunately, I wasn't in the Azerbaijan, but maybe like next time I'm going to actually fly there and see your amazing yeah. city. Thank see you. you. Bye. Yes, guys, our next speaker is Kartik, and he will be joined in a few uh, seconds. And uh, you will take a fast talk with him. His production views it as a flow for developing machine learning solutions for a wide range of applications. And he will talk uh, on introduction to on the wise machine learning. It's so interesting. Uh, as well. Hello, Kartik. Hi. Hello. How are you? Um, so hi everyone. Um, I'm Karthik. Uh, probably I just have to yeah. Let me quickly share my screen. I just have to quickly share my screen and <laughs> I just need to give it some permissions. Um, okay, so let me try again. So can you see my screen? Uh, yes. Okay, good. So hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon. Uh, and um, I hope you're doing well. I'm Karthik. Uh, I work for uh, uh, SAP as a senior data scientist. And uh, uh, today I will, um, I'm also, I also work as, um, uh, you know, I, I also teach machine learning as a Google developer expert, similar to Sergey does. Um, and I also, I live in Germany as well. Um, Today, what we will do is we will also, as a follow-up now, uh, now that you've already gotten an introduction to what TensorFlow 2.4 has to offer, uh, we will look at what, um, you know, how can you actually do this on uh, probably like smaller devices like smartphones or Arduinos and uh, yeah, some small things like Raspberry Pi, for example. Um, what this, uh, this uh, presentation will also do is also share some best practices, some guides, and so on that will also let you do. Uh, we'll also probably look at an example uh, that will get you started with, uh, so for example, you know, for model optimization, and we will also see how to do that. So yeah, that's uh, probably we will get started straight away. So why are we talking about uh, on-device machine learning? So machine learning has been pretty, you know, very well thought of. Very, uh, it's been an exciting field. Uh, it is a, quite a very, um, you know, a field that actually, you know, pays a lot. You know, you have exciting results. You see pretty cool uh, outputs. Um, not only that, um, machine learning model seems to also, you know, developing machine learning models seems to have uh, have this uh, impact of you know requiring complex hardware. Like if you want to do something, you need to have uh, pretty fancy GPUs or TPUs access to all of these, and uh, this has made access to you know machine learning models very very difficult. Uh, what this means is that uh, people who do not have access to, say, a complex GPU might actually lose out, which should not be the case. We want to have uh, also an, um, uh, be able to run uh, machine learning on smaller devices. And how do we do that? So what is a case where, um, you know, not just running on a server like an enterprise, which is actually running, uh, you know, highly scalable machines, but rather what about, you know, a mobile device, for example, or an edge device in this case. Uh, so this is where um, uh, we talk about um, edge machine learning. So how do we do that? Uh, why are we talking about edge? Uh, predominantly because um, edge ML has a very low latency. Why? Because um, I'm not you know, posting something and then it's not going back and you know, coming back, uh, uh, taking a request and a response and then uh, processing this response to actually provide uh, you know, the final output but rather it runs on the device itself. So it's running on the device and it's giving you results on the device itself. Uh, so this actually provides a very low latency, as you know, because it's quite running straight away behind, right behind your device. Um, with this, what happens is that you also have, uh, you know, no need for, you know, the fact that you don't need to be connected to an internet connection always. 
because your compute is actually pretty much running behind your uh, device itself. So you don't need to worry about sending this to a server, which is actually going to process this and then send this back. So that is one, yet another point that you will actually make things uh, life easier for someone running on a device itself. Uh, the third one is, of course, privacy and protection. So now, if you're talking about EU GDPR, uh, it becomes important that uh, you know if I don't want my data to be residing on a server or going to an you know external party, then I don't want this information to be going out of my device. So whatever be the device, um, which means that I don't uh, you know this is preserving all my privacy as well. So that's one of the biggest uh, advantages of doing uh, ML on device itself. So Having all said this, done. So, what what happens? So, what is the ability of, uh, you know, uh, what can we do with machine learning on an edge device? So, what are the possibilities? So, this is an example of um, um, on-device machine learning, where uh, you know, if you go to YouTube, so you could actually do um, an augmented reality. Uh, so, for actually cosmetics. So, basically, you see this person actually applying, uh, you know, using augmented reality purely by uh, looking at a video and then choosing the color and then they looking to see how it actually appears on themselves. So, this is a classic case where machine learning is actually used to figure out uh, some of the points of the person's face and then using those points to actually apply you know cosmetics in the case but it could be anything so this is just one example right um, but you see this is a very famous example where uh, this actually makes uh, you know life easier for someone who wants to try with just a video so with just youtube you already uh, have captured a market which is trying to already you know get uh, you know attention from what you want to actually already share so this is actually pretty exciting. So this is actually a, a very interesting way to do it. So it's running on the device and it's also doing, uh, you know, pretty quick uh, uh, computes as well. And it's actually showing the results right there on your device. And this is actually pretty cool. Um, and of course, you would have all have used Google Translate, uh, which allows you to capture text. So basically, uh, if you, tra you travel a lot, and especially, uh, yeah, so typically what happens is when you want to go to a new place, uh, what you would do is effectively you would download that uh, in the new place's language, and then you will try to use Google Translate most likely. And the advantage with doing on device is that you don't need internet connection. So there is a high likelihood that, say, for example, you land in an airport, uh, not these days, uh, but probably probably after all this is done, probably you land in a new place and then you want to actually translate it. For example, if you fly from Azerbaijan to say Germany, and then you want to translate it into English, for example, then if you don't know German, then you would probably try to you know, use Google Translate and then uh, with on device, so you, you don't need an expect, you don't expect this to actually have an internet connection running. So this is the advantage where it actually can translate whatever you're looking at in real time. So this is uh, one of the reasons why Google Translate has been really, really uh, useful for many people, especially when you're actually traveling. So having said all this, so how are we going to do this? So we actually saw about TensorFlow and what is new with TensorFlow 2.4, right? Uh, what we will talk about is how do we do on-device machine learning with TensorFlow Lite? Uh, so if, especially if you're interested in actually doing running um, apps on your mobile phone, especially if you're even if you're a web developer uh, or person you know, with mobile app, uh, you know, you're interested in developing mobile apps, uh, TensorFlow Lite could be a very useful application or a very useful library for you uh, to explore because of the fact that you can actually do quite a lot of uh, new things with uh, TensorFlow Lite. So, and we will exactly sh uh, share um, what we can actually do with this. Uh, it allows you to run uh, TensorFlow models on an edge device. So this is, of course, why we're actually talking about TensorFlow Lite, right? Um, which means that you don't need to actually customize uh, your model specifically for a given platform. And this actually becomes a big advantage for <clears throat> someone who's actually doing mobile app development. And uh, as you see here, it actually allows you to do um, on iOS, on Android, on of course on uh, Raspberry Pi, and of course on also on Coral TPU as well. And we will see what that actually means if you've not heard about Coral TPU devices. So when we're talking about uh, TensorFlow Lite, and so we start with, of course, smartphones. So which is, this is the biggest and the largest market. Um, and uh, this is something that uh, TensorFlow Lite has to support. So this is, of course, a smartphone, typically an Android or an iOS device. And not only that, uh, um, so TensorFlow Lite is also going to support um, Raspberry Pi, so our Coral Dev, uh, uh, you know, a developer board as well. So we will see about this as well. 
And um, the final thing is um, an Arduino, which is actually pretty cool. So you see um, Arduino is actually a pretty small um, a microcontroller, and you can actually do pretty cool uh, you know, com computes, machine learning computes on an Arduino device. And this is actually really, really exciting. And, um, and this is what we will try to see today, how we can actually do this, and um, uh, what are the things that you can do to make your existing models also better to be more edge compatible or edge ML compatible. So first, uh, let's take um, Android, so or iOS, and of course, because of the fact that smartphones are probably, you know, the most popular platform. Um, of course, Tensorflow Lite supports uh, iOS and Android at this moment, um, and this is, of course, due to different things, and of course, these being the most widely used platforms, uh, these two are the most obvious uh, platforms of support for Tensorflow Lite. Um, and of course, with, uh, with the fact that we, uh, you know, because of our, um, Android, um, so Google's largest, some of the apps are actually going to use TensorFlow Lite. So, for example, if you look at Google Photos, or uh, you know, even your Google Keyboard, or YouTube, or even Google Assistant uh, would also have, uh, you know, uh, TensorFlow Lite. Uh, not only that, um, so third-party apps like Uber or Hike or even more actually uh, support TensorFlow Lite. So, of course, to do um, a lot of on-device computes, on-device ML computations. And this is why, uh, you know, this is actually really, really exciting, uh, why TensorFlow Lite is actually um, useful for you as well, if you're especially a mobile app developer. So uh, in most of the cases, um, we see that TensorFlow Lite is actually used around images and uh, text and speech. Uh, but of course, you could uh, do a you know a, a workflow for an image, text, and speech as well, uh, and a lot of uh, uh, cases around uh, audio and content generation is also showing up these days. So uh, this is one of the new ways in which uh, content generation is also made by machine learning. So it's actually possible by machine learning, and uh, TensorFlow Lite is uh, sort of aiding you in actually doing this as well. Uh, not only that, uh, TensorFlow Lite uh, also supports, so Google actually has something called the ML Kit. So this is for uh, supporting uh, machine learning on mobile devices, uh, which uh, this actually runs, uh, builds on top of TensorFlow Lite, and it provides a, some pre-trained models that you can actually use for on-device machine learning use cases. Um, for example, so this is a Google Translate, right? So you can actually recognize text and detect objects and so on. Uh, so where uh, you can use this API to directly, uh, so for mobile developers, it actually becomes really, really uh, easier for you to actually uh, integrate uh, really complex machine learning tasks without actually going through the rigors of going through uh, learning, you know, taking through courses of machine learning and uh, so on. So this is one of the biggest advantages with uh, going for something like an ML kit. And of course, uh, this is a start. So maybe you can start here, uh, take the concepts, and then if you like further, dig deeper and then learn more about machine learning as well. And that could be, of course, the best way to go forward. But this is, so MLKit actually offers you a pretty cool introduction to uh, machine learning as well, if you're especially a mobile uh, developer, of an app developer, for example, uh, with no machine learning background. Um, with TensorFlow Lite, uh, so the, of course, Linux-based devices are, of course, also supported. And as you see, uh, Raspberry Pi is a classic example of this, um, and uh, along with the Coral Dev Board as well. Um, we will see what uh, sort of Linux-based IoT devices uh, could especially be targeted over here. And here is an example of um, what TensorFlow Lite can actually, how TensorFlow Lite actually uh, can work on an IoT device. Uh, in this case, this is an example of um, a, a robot, a vacuum cleaner, um, where it can actually detect obstacles uh, through the use of machine learning, so by object detection here. And uh, you can, of course, uh, pre it uses, say, for example, your pre-trained models uh, that actually can be fine-tuned to actually detect the more objects that uh, this particular example wants to actually detect. In this case, say, for example, wires or shoes or people or so on, uh, which is at the ground level, right? So this is a pretty classic example of how uh, even a low compute device like a robot vacuum cleaner could actually leverage something like as complex as object detection. So if you especially have a background with machine learning, um, object detection is a pretty complex task which actually requires uh, a lot of compute for training as well as for inference. But if you see this sort of like an integration on a robotic vacuum cleaner, this is actually really, really exciting to see how much the field has actually you know, improved and how, much, how far it has actually come. So this is a classic example of um, 
So the next one is uh, Coral Device, so it's a dev board. As you see, TensorFlow Lite can, of course, uh, run on a pretty small hardware acceleration, accelerator called the Coral TPU, or the Edge TPU, where uh, this actually uses uh, TensorFlow Lite models to actually run on IoT devices, as you see. How, how small it is for in comparison to the US one cent, it's actually smaller than a US one cent. So this is one of the pretty cool ways in which the edge TPU uh, device can actually enable uh, ML operations as well. And of course, uh, what you need to also understand is um, these operations are also a bit more, it's an evolving field, so which means that not all operations will be, some, uh, will be supported. Uh, but you can, of course, uh, go to the HTPU uh, page as well and then uh, try to find out which are the operations that are supported and you can start integrating it uh, right away. And uh, HTPU is actually available in several form factors under the Coral brand name. So in case you're wondering how you can actually already try it out and if you're already excited for uh, the Coral or the HTPU, you can uh, search for the Coral brand and then you can actually find out some of the HTPU devices already available in market right now. So uh, here you will see some of the examples of uh, you know the HDPU with the Coral Dev Board, uh, where basically uh, what the uh, Dev Board is basically is, uh, is a mini computer and at a, such a small uh, factor um, form factor, uh, which is actually running an ARM CPU, um, and uh, of course it's running a Linux OS, and uh, because that's a, this is why we are talking about this, right? Uh, it's a Linux-based IoT device or IoT compute that we are trying to talk about, and um, what a USB accelerator the Coral USB accelerator does is it actually allows you to do some inference um, uh, or do uh, you know other things on an, an IoT device, so especially to enable complex operations, ML operations on an IoT device. And this is the core idea behind uh, your, your, the USB accelerator uh, for this Coral uh, dev boards. Um, Especially, of course, when on running on production, uh, you can, of course, use the, the system, on, system on module uh, form factor or the PCIe uh, one to integrate it into your existing hardware as well. So this is also available. This is also possible uh, when especially you're, you're trying to integrate it into a sort of like a production environment. And of course, for, for prototyping, of course, the, the way you support it is through, go through the dev board or the USB accelerator. And of course, for sensing, yeah, you 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 look at different uh, modules that are available, and I, this is a growing field. So of course, you will see more and more modules being added to this going forward. The final platform that we'll also talk about is. Uh, Basically, uh, this is the Arduino platform uh, where we will actually look at, um, you know, so how Arduino is actually going to, you know, leverage TensorFlow computes, TensorFlow ops. Um, here, uh, what, uh, what, first of all, if in case uh, an Arduino is actually new to you, uh, what is, so Arduino is basically a micro microcontroller. Uh, what this means is that it actually targets specific operations uh, with a very low compute uh, or a very uh, low footprint and you know, compute footprint and low power footprint as well. Um, and uh, this does not, of course, it's not a general purpose computer, but a computer that actually does specific tasks. Um, so for example, you could see an example being for, for exa used in say a microwave or for example, even smoke detectors or toys, say a ro uh, robot, um, you know, remote sensing car uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so of course, the, the fact here is that you can integrate this with something like a, uh, with, a, with an Arduino is actually pretty cheap. Uh, and a very low compute, of course, but there there are lots of uh, you know compute limitations as well, which you need to take care and you need to understand how to do this as well. And this is where we also see an example of how you could actually do this, and uh, we will also see how we can actually use machine learning to actually you know put into something as small as a, a ten cent uh, you know a one cent chip, you know, as, 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 as small as a one cent chip. So. Uh, with one of the classic examples also being this hot word detection. So of course, if you if I say a particular hot word, I don't want to trigger all you know hot words. So for example, if you're listening, if your phone is listening, or if you have devices at home listening, uh, you can actually uh, you know it actually runs a typical uh, a DSP uh, uh, on the device, which actually is running behind the scenes, which is actually looking for a particular hot word. 
uh, which actually wakes up the rest of the device. And this is also running a small um, uh, an inference, basically, to actually do this sort of this um, this power, this right. And this is also a typical microcontroller, uh, which is in use. So, which is also probably also in use in your phone, uh, which is used in probably your Alexa or your uh, even your Google Home or your Apple Home or whatever. All of these are actually running smaller chips, which are actually looking for particular keywords just straight train to you know look at this uh, particular keyword to actually wake up as well so this is a, a, a prime example of uh, why this might be actually useful so you could do this to integrate uh, certain other things and then also start to you know uh, wake up a device and then do certain things or you know look for a particular person's voice and then do certain things uh, so it depends on the application that you're trying to build but this is just an example which is already running in most of the devices that we already own so your phone being classical example here so uh, how do you get started? So of course, uh, you could actually go to the uh, Arduino, uh, also the TensorFlow page as well, where it actually there's a beautiful guide which actually talks to you about which Arduino hardware is supported or how you, which are the options that are actually supported. And there is also a very interesting speech detection uh, application also built in there you, for you to actually uh, deploy like a TensorFlow light model uh, within a span of five minutes. So you can actually go out there and then deploy it and then check it out how it actually works. It can actually do this hardware detection on an Arduino as well. Uh, so I, I would uh, highly recommend you to go to the uh, TensorFlow Lite microcontroller webpage for you to actually do that uh, so that you can actually get more details and also find more information there, uh, especially to you know, get started if you're, this is the first time you're looking at um, TensorFlow Lite and Arduinos especially. So. We will come to how do we, you know, do this? Uh, how do how are we going to make the model smaller? How are we actually going to optimize? Um, this might be, you know, probably your interest as well. So I have a machine learning model. I would like to deploy it on my phone or on my probably on my Raspberry Pi. How do I do it? So you're here. So this is what we are going to do now. So we are going to talk about optimization. So uh, edge devices typically have CPU. So uh, this is one of the things that you should also know. We are not going to train. So we are not going to actually train on an edge device, but an edge device is typically used for inference, which means that you're going to actually uh, have very low uh, CPU capabilities and memory as well. Um, so this is one of the things that uh, is actually very, very important. Uh, so unlike a server, um, your edge de edge device is not going to have uh, it's not it's typically probably going to be powered by a battery. So uh, this is also something that you will have to understand. Uh, you need to actually keep your power consumption to as minimal as possible, and uh, your model size is also important, right? So of course you cannot uh, you cannot have a, an app which is probably 100 MB and then a model which is 1 GB, right? This is not going to work. And so this is why typically you would want to have say a very small footprint for your model as well and then probably you know this is probably acceptable you will probably have a 100 mb app and say for example a 10 mb model which is not bad i would it's not so great of course you would probably also want even lower but uh, a, ten, a 10 mb model running on device is pretty cool especially considering uh, like i said if you look at uh, you know earlier you know if you were uh, with inception and vgc and all that uh, running that even on a complex server back in like 2012, 2013 was quite a big challenge. So even then it was actually, uh, but looking these days, we are actually looking at uh, 10 MB, making that, bringing that down to 10 MB and then deploying it on a phone. And this is actually really, really interesting, right? Uh, so this is why this is also fine. I think going forward, we will make it even smaller. Uh, but today, what we'll look at is how do we do this? How do we bring it down to say uh, from a 500 MB file to a 10 MB file? So how do we do that? So this is what uh, we are actually going to look at. Uh, how do we optimize the model for on-device deployment? So first is to actually uh, use a mobile optimized architecture. So we will look at what this actually means. Um, uh, you, there are actually a list of um, uh, um, you know architectures because uh, the operations are not all operations. Not all operations are actually supported on all devices. This is why we have a constraint over here uh, to actually have uh, choose a mobile optimized. Uh, you know this is why you need to also understand what do you mean by mobile optimized models. Uh, you can actually go to uh, the TensorFlow Lite page and then you can also find this list there. But um, to give you an idea, you will actually say, for example, mobile net is a mobile optimized uh, uh, model. So we will see about that as well in some uh, further slides. 
The second step is uh, now that you've chosen the model, let's, uh, you know, you will go for a quantization. So what is quantization? We will see that as well. So quantization actually reduces the size of your model and um, also reduces the, the, you know, the precision of uh, uh, how your model actually does inference. And um, the third step would be to do pruning. So we will also see how uh, to do pruning as well today. And then we will look at um, probably also an example uh, which actually does this pruning and then how we can actually reduce it and how much it actually improves the model as well. And finally, leverage the hardware accelerator itself. So uh, like I said, uh, first of all, choose a model architecture that is actually compatible. So here we see uh, inception versus mobile net, right? So there's not much of a big loss in terms of the performance. Of course, you're going to lose some performance. That's a given. Uh, in this case, we are talking about image classification. Uh, and when you're talking about image classification, uh, so typically the top five is not bad at all. So the top five of 92.8 versus 95 is not a big loss in terms of the performance, I would say. But if you look at the amount of, you know, the uh, the inference latency, uh, so here the inference latency is calculated on the Pixel 4, um, a four-threaded CPU, uh, is significantly high. You have a 37 time uh, improvement in terms of the inference performance here. And if you see at the, if you look at the model size itself, it comes down from a, you know, 170 model to actually a 22 MB model. So this is a significant drop in, in the size of the model as well. So this is actually really useful, especially considering we're doing compute on device, right? And uh, finally, we're looking at um, so you know, you know, model accuracy versus model size. So this is also something that you need to understand. This is more like uh, what more you know when you choose a model, uh, you know, which model might be useful for you. If you want a more uh, more performant model, you might have to, of course, maybe also take a, a size a larger sized model as well. This might be also needed, but you you have to do further steps to actually make it uh, more you know suited for your scenario so probably this is where we'll talk about quantization so typically when you talk about quantization uh, quantization actually reduces from let's say the 14.32 bit uh, 14.2 for example an 8 bit int uh, what this does is uh, you add the some you know a percentage point loss in accuracy you will get a significant uh, reduction in terms of the uh, model size so this is something which actually becomes so for example actually in some cases when you're actually having a lower uh, bit representation uh, the model size actually becomes in most cases four times lower than the original floating point model as well. So this is something that is actually really powerful uh, for you to actually uh, do on your model. So this is an example where uh, you actually look at how mobile net where uh, you know, the V1, V2 uh, with a floating baseline actually post quantization, uh, you see there is actually not big of a loss in terms of the performance and in terms of the accuracy, but you, there's a, there is actually a big improvement in terms of, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the overall uh, go, the, the uh, you know, the, the gain in terms of the size of the model. So in terms of how small the model becomes in terms of, you know, putting into the uh, final, um, into the device itself. So we'll talk about quickly about pruning. So I think um, uh, when we talk about pruning, pr pruning is basically if you if you've already have some experience with um, say with machine learning, uh, you would have heard about say something called dropout, right? So with pruning, what happens is you're basically uh, dropping these connections in between, and then you're trying to see when you're actually training, you're actually telling the model, hey, I'm going to actually not use you, but instead, uh, why don't uh, I actually you know just to see how powerful the model already gets. Versus also uh, what you can also do is you can you know when you do once you train the model you can also uh, see if you can add, uh, you know having sparse models are actually also uh, pretty useless so it's also going to be you know to occupy some memory as well and it's for during inference time it's also not going to be useful. Uh, and this is where uh, you know sparse smaller models or sparse tensors can be compressed. So with pruning, so this is what we'll also see in some time. And not only that, with lesser operations, uh, of course, it's going to be the model is going to be faster to execute. And um, this is the advantages with pruning itself. I will quickly go through the uh, the loss itself. You see, basically, there isn't a big uh, loss in terms of the uh, the performance when, when you talk about the pruning itself. So we go from a zero percent pruning to up to eighty percent pruning is not a big loss. You see on as you see on the page. Uh, but this is this is the biggest advantage. So at a small loss of uh, accuracy, you get a big um, you know a big gain in terms of the size of the model, in terms of reducing the size of the model. So this is where uh, actually it becomes very very easier for you to actually deploy on an on-device uh, sort of like a setting. 
And uh, finally, when you're talking about TensorFlow light models, uh, you can also speed up this inference time by actually, you know, looking at uh, which, uh, so, you know, sort of using this on-device GPU if it is available. So in cases like, say, for example, with, uh, say, that Pixel or even with so iOS as well, uh, there is also different uh, neural engines that are actually available right now. Uh, so typically, uh, TensorFlow light model should be able to leverage that as well. So if you can do that, then that will be really good in terms of, as you see, in terms of the performance itself, there is a big improvement in terms of the performance. So th there are lots of examples that you can actually find out on the TensorFlow Light page. So this is a particular page that might be of interest to you, especially if you're interested in actually already taking an existing example and then uh, you know already seeing how you can already you know reuse it or uh, try to understand the overall architecture itself. Uh, but before you get started. Um, a point for you to note is that not all TensorFlow operations are actually supported. So uh, I would highly recommend you to actually look at the operator compatibility page. Um, this is primarily because of uh, a lot of reasons when it comes to the operations and how complex it is on running on, on device itself, especially given the architecture of the device. So this is why you need to also check this operator compatibility page uh, when you actually convert the model as well. Um, and um, so as in the previous point, uh, because of this uh, limited number of operations that are available, uh, for you to actually con uh, you know, conver uh, convert this model into a particular, into a, a TF light model, um, certain TensorFlow operations, uh, only certain TensorFlow actually av are available. And you can actually see um, you know, how, which operations are actually available through the TensorFlow select guide. So which actually tells you which operation might actually be useful because of the TensorFlow interpreter running, uh, light interpreter actually running uh, all these operations operations as well. So yeah, I think uh, for Android especially, you can avoid this by actually, uh, the, the primary problem especially uh, is in the fact that uh, the TensorFlow models, uh, the uh, TensorFlow light models uh, with TensorFlow operations uh, typically require uh, the TensorFlow runtime, right? So this actually becomes uh, unnecessarily bulky and unnecessarily complex. And this is where on Android, you can actually avoid this by selectively building only you know, operations that are actually required for that particular model. And this is the reason why this TensorFlow Select Guide might also be useful for you to find out TensorFlow Light friendly operations. And um, so, so one of the, like I said, so it does not. So one of the things that you also have to note is that you cannot train on device yet. So again, yet is the point here. Probably in the future, you might actually also get some information on that. Uh, but the TensorFlow Lite uh, roadmap is actually pretty clear. You will actually look at what are the key concepts that are looking at typically around usability, performance, optimization, and portability. Um, and there is also a very active TensorFlow Light discussion group. You can actually find more information on the roadmap page uh, linked over here on this slide. And I can also share this on later. Uh, but this is uh, so there are some additional resources uh, that might also be useful for you, especially uh, uh, when you're considering TensorFlow Light. Uh, you know, for you to also guides and there are tutorials. And of course, there is also a tiny ML course as well as uh, device-based ML uh, uh, course for you with TensorFlow Lite. So both of these are Google-supported uh, courses. So you, you're going to get uh, the most up-to-date information, or especially to getting started with uh, TensorFlow Lite and uh, getting on you know, getting to know how to, you know, go from a TensorFlow core uh, model to a TensorFlow Lite-based model. So that's uh, before, uh, I think this is towards coming towards uh, the end of my presentation. Uh, but before I actually get into, uh, you know, the Q&A part, I'm not sure how long we have, but I just wanted to also share a quick, uh, uh, you know, a, a deep, uh, some of the uh, information about how we could actually do, you know, pruning, for example. So there's a very nice, uh, so by the way, can you see my, um, uh, see my, uh, my page? Um, so, um, Nihat, can you see my page? Yeah, yeah we, okay. We can see your page. Yeah, the, the so here this is a collab notebook which is actually talking about pruning. Uh, so I just wanted to quickly share, uh, you know, what happens typically uh, when you actually prune, as well as how a model size actually also. Ca ca first of all, how can you prune versus uh, what are the advantages or how much accuracy do you actually lose as well, and so on. Uh, 
uh, since I think this was a question that was already asked. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, it's it's perfectly. Let's quickly go through this. So first of all, this is the baseline test accuracy. Uh, so typically, I, I just took a ten, uh, an MNIST model here. I can also share this example as well uh, as a later um, link as well. So this is basically taking the MNIST model and then trying to prune the model. Uh, and with TensorFlow, this is basically there is a model optimization tool which actually lets you do pruning. So here, what we're doing is we're actually pruning uh, this model with starting from 50% sparsity up to 80% sparsity uh, to see how much of an accuracy it loses versus you know, also the size of the model. So we will look at both of this towards the end. So here you see the you know with uh, the pruning we get up to uh, trainable parameters. So the model is going to learn up to twenty thousand four hundred parameters. Versus uh, if you look at the uh, earlier uh, summary, which was I think I could also have done that. But in any case, so we will still come back to that. Uh, and I think in the end, when you look at the size of the model, you'll also see that. Um, when you actually train the model, uh, the baseline test accuracy is about 97.67 versus the pruned test accuracy is about 97.46, not a great loss, right? So this is the biggest advantage with uh, doing pruning. So at the expense of you know uh, a slight loss in this case, it's of course not a fancy, um, also a fancy uh, model as well. It's just an MNIST and then also doing a very simple um, operation of a classification here. Um, so here we have different ways in which we can actually look at this model itself. So here we just want to save this model and look at how much of a, you know how much of an advantage we are getting in terms of the size. So if you look at the baseline Keras model. So typically, the model was close to around 78 kilobytes uh, versus how small it actually has become when it actually from 78 to actually comes down to 25,000 versus 24,000. So this is how small it actually becomes. So close to it actually reduces the size. So the baseline model is three times the size of the pruned TensorFlow like model. Uh, so this is the advantage that you actually get typically with around pruning. And uh, you can, of course, by choosing to actually going even more with even harsh pruning, you could actually reduce this even more. And this is where we actually look at how big. So basically, we can reduce it by 10 times more and more and by coming down to even more stricter pruning, even more complex, um, even more uh, you know, uh, pruning with even uh, aggressive pruning, rather. Uh, so yeah, so this is the biggest advantage I can, I'm not sure how what more information might be useful here. But you see with the pruned TensorFlow light accuracy versus the TensorFlow test accuracy, prune is not big loss at all. So in this, of course, is also a pretty simple example. Uh, but this actually shows you how you can you know, do something like this on your existing models as well, and how you can do how you can get your models size reduced as well as understand the performance versus size, size, uh, model size trade-offs as well. But yeah, so this was uh, a quick uh, look into uh, on-device machine learning and some of the links and some of the resources that you can use to uh, you know, do on-device machine learning. Um, I'm happy to take some questions or if there are any questions. Um, Thank you, Kartik, for this amazing mm -hmm. uh, slides and presentation. So uh, I think we have one question related to uh, how to use the flight dot converter. Okay, so this info. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry for interrupting. So the TF light converter is actually used. So like I showed in the example here, right? So you can actually use the TensorFlow light converter in multiple ways. So directly through the um, API itself, uh, you can actually use the converter. So there are actually, um, you can you can use this TF light converter in multiple ways to actually, there are lots of, I, I would suggest you to actually go to the TensorFlow light page to actually get this uh, exact usage as well. I can share more information as well if you're interested, but this is actually pretty well documented. Uh, uh, on the page itself, um, you can actually see this TensorFlow Light converter uh, on how you can do, say, for example, for TensorFlow, uh, if you're using a TF2.0 uh, model versus a TF1.0 model, and so on, uh, you can do it through the API itself, which is, of course, the most recommended uh, way of doing things. Uh, and of course, there is also a command line operation as well, where you can actually fit the output model, the output file versus the saved file that you already use from Keras to actually do these H5 
of saving, right? I, the example that I just showed you, uh, where which actually lets you save the model file as well. Um, but yeah, so the TF Lite convert uh, is actually uh, there are the two ways. So one is through the Python API, and the other one is through the command line. So both of these are actually pretty simple ways of doing it, but the Python API is much more, uh, it gives you the flexibility and also, also provides you with uh, more uh, also uh, options to actually do the, uh, the saving and also with pruning and things like that, right? So you can actually have more flexibility through the Python API. Okay, thank you. Thank you for answer. Thank you for okay. speaking. Great thank you. Your and effort you take to share your experiences on TensorFlow. And yeah, thank you for your contribution. Thank you. See you. See you. Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear, uh, we can hear you. How are you, Luis? I'm fine, and you? Me also, then let's stop your presentation. Nice. Me oh, nice. <laughs> so, hi, everyone. My name is Gus. I am from the TensorFlow uh, DevRel. And today, I'd like to talk a little bit about TensorFlow Hub and NLP. First of all, I'm very glad to be here. I've never talked to this group of people before. So, I hope I can do this more often in the future. And I hope you can uh, enjoy the rest of the talk. I can still see the question, the last question from how to use TF Lite Converter in the screen. I don't know if all of you can see that or it doesn't matter. I'll go on. <laughs> so, I guess uh, when we start to talk about, uh, let's start from NLP. What's nice? What's NLP? Uh, we're trying to think, we're trying to explain to a machine. <clears throat> how to deal with text. And if we think a little bit, uh, I guess text is one of the biggest inventions ever created. Not exactly text, but writing was one of the biggest inventions created by humanity because without writing, we cannot pass knowledge forward properly. We can, of course, talk to people, but this knowledge, as we talk to people, it changes, right? People give their perspective so you lose the uh, original idea. So when you write it, it's the same. You, everyone, everybody kind of reads the same thing. And this is was huge, right? And that enabled all of what we have today. So that's very, very interesting. Uh, and so when we start to deal with text, uh, the other thing we can we have to think is when we are small kids, the first thing we learn after speaking, right? We learn how to read. The next thing we learn is how to write. Uh, and But there is one thing that comes way later, which is proper understanding. When we read at first, we read uh, some very simple books with images, with pictures, right? We read small things, and then we start to write. We start to read longer and longer texts. But to get a very deep understanding of what's there, it takes maybe 10 years, right? It's when you are in high school, when you are way older that you can read something and get the nuances about that and can you can discuss that and uh so as we, as we can see by ourselves understanding the context of what's written it's not simple it's a hard skill it's something that takes a while right uh and that's very very interesting how do, can we uh bring that to the machine and that's where the NLP field uh, studs, it's a, uh, it's a very, uh, there's a lot of things happening in this field. It's very, very, uh, it's full of ideas. Every day there's something new. NLP stands for Natural Language Processing. And give me just one second. I have to adjust the size of my screen here. Nice. Uh, and so what does NLP uh, stud? It's how to give in text, uh, explain to the machine what does it mean, explain context, explain language nuances, explain regionalisms, explain all these kinds of things. So how can we make machine understand that and help us back? And then when we say uh, help us back is all kinds of tasks, tes tasks, sorry, all kinds of tasks. That's the most basic ones that you I guess you've seen on a daily basis is, for example, 
uh, translation, grammar correction, uh, smart reply when you're doing uh, messaging, right? When you're texting people, or maybe when you are uh, speaking and there's this transcription that can show up like subtitles, right? That's also something you can see uh, on a daily basis, but there are more way more tasks that NLP can do. For example, you can do sentiment analysis, which is given something that's written, it can tell you if it's a positive or negative sentiment, if it's something bad or something good. Uh, it can do also sentence similarity to see if two sentences ex are trying to entail the same concept. You can do, of course, text summarization, which is getting a lot of text and extract from it, from it just the most basic ideas so you can... Uh, understand at least briefly a bigger corpus of, of text, but with fewer uh, sentences. We can do also something called entity extraction, which is uh, given you have a bunch of text, you can extract from it like an address, a proper name, uh, a situation, uh, a name of a company, name of, a, 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 I don't know, a, uh, some, a celebrity. All this is entity extraction. Other thing we can do is uh, question answering. You can give a text, for example, a Wikipedia page to a machine, and then you can ask questions about that page, and the machine will find for you where the answer is and give you it back to you. This seems like something that anyone can do, right? You can read and you can extract that yourself, but for a machine, that's absurdly complex task. And that's what NLP tried to do. And that's what we are going to try to show today some, some of it. Uh, and then the next question you might have is, okay, uh, how does it, how, how can that be possible? Uh, how can you explain the text for a machine? And the thing is that, that when we talk about machine learning, what is really happening is mach machine learning, a machine learning module learns how to convert a set of numbers to another set of numbers. That's what it learns, right? It finds patterns in these numbers, given the labels, and then gives you back uh, another set of numbers. So it's a number transformation, let's say. So the, the machine learning model is basically an absurdly long equation. How can you input text to it? How can you give text and uh, get some number back, some uh, any kind of information from it? How can you summarize a text? How does it work? So one thing we have to do is we have to find a way to convert text to numbers somehow. Somehow you have to convert this text to numbers. And the other thing uh, that we have to pay attention is how we cannot convert anyway, right? Because if you convert anyway, we are losing what the text means. So the context is very important. And there's a bunch of ways of trying to do that. Let's try the most basic one. Uh, the basic we encoding that which is changing text to number that we can do is the ASCII encoding, right? We just get every letter and give a number to that. That's the ASCII encoding. Every, le every letter has always the same number. We have some example here, an example for listen. And this, of course, you can convert to that, but there's a, a, a problem here. If we think that silent is almost the opposite of listen, and they have exactly the same numbers for their letters, right? Because they have the same letters, uh, so they have the same set of numbers. So if you just do this kind of conversion, you are losing all of the meaning of associated with that word. Right. This, so this is a problem. We can, this, it can work, but it's not going to work for more uh, hard problems. Right. For very very basic, this can work. The other possibility we can try is we can, for each word, we can give a number, and use that number to express a sentence. So, for example, I would instead of giving "I love my dog" to the machine learning model. I would give an array with the number zero, uh, one, two, three, and four. And then uh, the machine would deal with that. Uh, that kind of works. Uh, this uh, We call this tokenization. So we divide our uh, sentence in tokens and we give one specific ID for each token. But the problem here is that this has no context involved. You're just giving random numbers. And if you have a very long dictionary of words, maybe 10,000, 20,000 words, doing this is very hard 
because you have words like depending on the order you do the uh, very uh, very common words will have like super high numbers and that doesn't make it too, too much sense the order doesn't make any sense for so the machine will have a hard time understanding and giving you back any re good results so there is a better way of doing that and this is called language embeddings so language embedding is getting a text and for each word let's do for the word embeddings we can do sentence embeddings but we can, let's talk about word embeddings for each word we'll give it uh, we'll try to give a lot of numbers to represent this word instead of just one we're going to give an array of numbers this array represents the points in the nth space nth dimension here we can see three dimensions because we can only see up to three dimensions but the data set here had i guess a hundred dimensions so you can imagine for each word we have an array with a hundred float numbers why does this matter because when we have this kind of representation you can this uh, this array you can calculate distance to other arrays and the when you create a proper word embedding which is very hard but when you you have one you can see that words that are similar are close by in the space so you spread them around the hyperspace the nth dimension space and then words that are similar will be close by and this is a property that helps the machine understand context of what you're saying because it knows that a word is similar to another or it's not similar. Of course, the opposite is valid. And it's easier for the machine. But although this representation is very good, uh, we have a problem. How do you create this representation? This is very hard. This takes expertise. It's not for anyone. And there's another problem. Uh, it is a specific per language. You have for this one that's showing the image there. It's an English version, so it's an English word embedding. You, but if you're doing a model, for example, in Portuguese, which is my native language, you need a Portuguese language embedding, and that's different. It's not the same distribution. The words are uh, some words are similar, but not all of them. There are different meanings. So this is this starts to get more and more complex. And you don't want to, first of all, you're trying to solve another problem. You're not trying to create a, a text embedding. You're trying to create, for example, sentiment analysis, right? You want to know if a sentence is positive or negative. And now all of a sudden, I give you a lot of more work. So you have to create this before. And this, uh, this might be hard. And by the way, parenthesis here, this comes from, if you go to projector.tensorflow.org, you can visualize that on your browser. Uh, I just did some recording here. Uh, so let's go back to, okay, I understand that language embeddings are cool and I need those. Uh, where can I find them? And that's a, that's a harder problem. You can find, uh, you can go search in the internet. Okay, we'll find some code repositories with that. Uh, and then you come up, come with a bunch of questions is how do I use this? Because anyone can create them and they have to document them properly. And do they? Do they give you a code examples? Do they uh, uh, did they do it in using uh, taking fairness into account? Do they look for other languages? Is how what's the quality? Who did this? Who is this person? All of these questions are super valid if you are going to use pieces of machine learning models from other people in your model, and. It, it's hard to find those answers, right? If you just go search the internet and get any kind of model that you search there or piece of model, it's hard to get all these answers. And that's where TensorFlow Hub can help you. TensorFlow Hub is a repository of machine learning models. Uh, and uh, language embedding is, is by itself a, a machine learning model. And on, on TensorFlow Hub, you can search, you can see documentation, you can do all of that. Let's go through TensorFlow Hub and all the features, and then we'll come back to NLP and see how TensorFlow Hub can help you uh, use, can help you with your NLP problem. First of all, first of all, uh, you don't have only text models on, on TensorFlow Hub. We have all kinds of models. We have, for example, for image, uh, we have for uh, text, audio, video. We have models for all these, these domains, let's say like that. Uh, 
And of course, these models can be deployed in multiple places. For example, they can be on your server. You can deploy them on your browser. You can deploy them on your mobile device, like our friend was just talking about, uh, deploying models with TF Lite. We have TF Lite models uh, available on TensorFlow Hub, a lot of those. And they are already converted. They give you the documentation to use them. Uh, so this is great. And we have thousands of models. Uh, you you can find almost anything you want there, and we, that's great. We have also some features for search and discovery. So you, of course you can search for any term you want for architecture, data set. You can also filter by specific things that you want. For example, I can, uh, uh, referring back my friend from the, from the previous session, uh, if you want a TF Lite module, you can just filter by modules that are that have a, a TF Lite version already published, or you can find a TFJS or Coral, which is a chipset for machine learning. So all of this is available. We are going to go into details in a little bit. And aside from having a good search and discovery to help you find things, whenever you find a module, uh, lots of them have already a visualizer right in the documentation page. So you don't need to do anything to try the model. For example, on the top left there, there is the birds uh, model. If you can search for birds uh, on TensorFlow Hub right now, the first model will be that one. And it, what it does, it given an image, it will tell you which bird it is on the image, which is the uh, most noticeable bird in the image, let's say like that. And you can just drag your image, an image of a bird you have and try and see the results. You don't need to do anything else. So uh, that's the easiest way possible to try a model. We have that for multiple other vision related models. We have one for audio, which is Spice. Spice is a pitch detection. So you can sing, <laughs> if you like that, you can sing and it will uh, show the pitch of your voice and can convert to musical notes, which is super cool. Uh, you can play with that. So you have a good visualizer. But then I we'll said, okay, nice. I like those. I like the, I don't know, food, <laughs> food related model. I like that. I want to, to use that. How do I use that? And that's uh, TensorFlow Hub also have links to collabs, to notebooks collab that you can click there and that will show a complete code on how to use the model. You, you don't need to do anything. You just have the, all the code you can run on Google Colab. If you don't know, Google Colab is a hosted environment for you to do machine learning, basically. You can, it runs on public VMs. It's completely free. You can use that. And it's an amazing tool for educational purpose because you don't need to install anything on your machine, everything on the browser. Uh, and you can use that to try those models. So the, the food one, you click, I don't know if the food one specifically has a collab, but uh, if not, I can add that next week. Uh, but the thing is you can try most of these models directly by clicking, go there. You also have a full documentation of everything about the model, uh, about what kind of inputs it, it uses, what kind of outputs it uses, architecture, which data set was used to train that model or which language it is, because for NLP, uh, uh, NLP will be, question. oh, I'll, I'll, sorry, sorry, I'll answer all the questions in the end. Sorry for, for not telling that we in this the beginning, so I don't have to stop, but I will come back. Uh, and then we have all this information. Uh, if the model is suitable for your use case, there's some information, for example, don't use these on self-driving cars. There is this kind of information in the documentation. There's the licensing and more sample code more links to resources. So the documentation is absurdly rich and helps you get things done, which is important. Now that we understood what's TensorFlow Hub, I would like to go over three examples of how we can use TensorFlow Hub to solve NLP problems, right? And in, the, uh, in, uh, in this path, I hope you can get a hold of how to use TensorFlow Hub and understand a little bit better NLP. Uh, let's see. So the first most basic use for NLP is use a language embedding. So getting a text, transform that to that those, those vectors I mentioned with N dimensions, right? Let's try that first. So this is TensorFlow Hub uh, page. This is the home page. Get there. As you can see, the first thing you can see is text problem, text problem domain, sorry. And what we want here we want to look for embeddings because we're looking for language embeddings. We just click there and then we get to this page with a lot of 
models and collections. You can see there are some that have a blue icon on the top left and some have an orange icon. So the blue ones, they are collections. Collections is an aggregation of similar models, right? So this helps you if you want to, for example, use BERT models, which we'll discuss in a little bit, there's a collection of BERT models. So you just go there and look into the collection. For us, we are going to look into the second row, first column, which is NNLM, which is uh, the embeddings I want to show. When we click there, we go to the collections page. The collections page have uh, the aggregation of all the models. And as you can see here, we have uh, models for 50 dimensions, which is the middle column. And we have models for 120 dimensions, which is the right column, column to the right. What does this number of dim dimensions mean? Remember, I told you that words are converted to arrays with a lot of floating numbers. So the, the models on the central column, the 50 dimensions, will for each word, it will return an array of 50 floating numbers, right? That represents a, a, a dot in, a fi in the 50th uh, hyperspace. And the other cool thing is if you see on the left column, you have multiple languages. So this model specifically is not English only. It has other languages. And if you're trying to do NLP for your specific language, you should try a language uh, language embedding for, that, for your language, of course. Uh, if there isn't one for your language, some models have multi-language support, which is they can do multiple languages at the same time. Of course, they cannot be as good as one that's very specific to one language. But if you don't have one, uh, that's uh, that's a good good thing to try yet. So we are going to use one of the 50 dimensions, uh, English version. When we click there, we get to the models specific page. As you can see here, uh, we have name, architecture, data set, all of that is explained there. Uh, but what I want specifically is the URL. Can you see the URL there, tfhub.dev? slash Google slash NNLM and Jim 50 slash two. So we have a lot of information here. I'm not going to go into details on all of that because it for now it doesn't really matter much. But what we need is that URL. Why do we need that URL? That is how you can use a model from TensorFlow Hub. You need that URL. That's how you represent it in code. Let's see some code and try to use that model. First thing we are going to do is, of course, import TensorFlow and TensorFlow Hub. Uh, next thing is we are going to use, we imported the library TensorFlow Hub. So Hub is a repository of models, and it has also a library for you to easily use any of those models. Here, the second line I'm importing this dependency. The third line, I'm using a, a method called load, which will, given a URL, download this model from TensorFlow Hub, store it locally, and load it to memory, and model, the variable model there, is already a machine learning model loaded to memory. You can use that directly. And we are going to use on these two sentences here. I love my dog. Today, the sky is blue. And so what we expect from results is two, uh, uh, we, have, we want two results, which are arrays of 50, dimensions. You can see there, we have these two results of 50 dimensions. So we have a, uh, this is specifically is a sentence encoding. So we are encoding the whole sentence, not only a word, everything. We get everything and we put in the space. This is, uh, uh, so this is, this makes, for example, if there's a sentence that's similar to, I love my dog, for example, I love my uh, wolf, let's say like that. I love my wolf. Wolf is similar to dog, right? Uh, you These sentences, if you plot them, or if you calculate the distance from both arrays, a, they would be shorter than if I say, I hate my uh, monitor, right? Of course, the sentence is completely different, so they should be far from, I love my wolf, or I like my dog. If there's a sense, I like my dog, it should be close to, I love my dog. So here in four lines of code, we can see that we can already extract language embeddings. Done, converted text to, uh, to numbers. I can use those numbers already on a machine learning model. And that's, that's a huge win. We didn't need to train anything. Let's go deeper now. 
let's try to do fine tuning. What's fine tuning? I want to create a model and use language something uh, language embedding to help me with my model. And I also want to uh, train on my own data. I want to create a model. What we're going to create here is a sentiment analysis model. And you will see that uh, how Hub can help you there. First thing we're going to do is what we did before. I, there's one, there's two differences here. Third line, third line, I'm using another uh, language embedding, which is not the 50 dimensions anymore. I'm using a 128 dimensions because it's, uh, of course, it's more complex. Each array has 128 floats uh, and it can entail better context. So it gives better results. So I'm changing, just changing that one line. I have a better model by just by doing that. Of course, this model is bigger and it might it might be slower. Uh, it makes might make your model a little bit slower. That's obvious, right? It's bigger, so th there is this uh, drawback there. And I'm going to use the hub module hub to do something different now. As you can see, I'm not using the load method method. I'm using the Keras layer method. Why I'm using that? Sorry, because I want to make this model part of my model. So I'm creating a Keras layer. For those of you that know TensorFlow 2 already, we use Keras as the main API, being suggested API, to create models where you kind of stack multiple layers. This Keras layer is one of them, is the embedding layer. It would be the one of the first layers that will receive text, convert to numbers, and then you do the rest. And that's exactly what we are doing here. We are creating a sequential model, which is a lot of layers one after the other, where the first one is our hub layer that we receive text. Uh, as you can see from the fourth line, uh, the input there, the D type is a string, right? So it receives a string. Uh, and then the, se the second line of the model, which is the dense layer over there, it is a dense layer with 16 neurons. And then we have a another dense layer with one neuron which is going to give me a score from, I guess it's minus one to one. And that's what we want. We want to be the, uh, I don't know if it's minus one to one or if it's zero to one, uh, sorry for, for that. We want is the lower the score, the lower the sentiment about that sentence and the higher is the opposite, right? Uh, so this is the model. Basically as that, we can compile and we can train our model. Of course, I skipped completely the part of the data. Uh, if you use the IMDB review data set to do that, uh, which is explained in that sample mentioned over there, where tutorials, Keras, text classification, it's the complete sample is there. Uh, you can see how to load this text and just do this training. This will give you like 80 something percent already of accuracy, which is very good given the work you did here, right? It's like a couple of lines of code. You have a model that's already impressive, let's say like that. And you can use to do sentiment analysis. So this is one of the basic uses of uh, Hub to help you with NLP. Extract language embeddings or train your own model. Let's go deeper. Let's talk a little bit about BERT and uh, how BERT can help you. Uh, so first of all, <laughs> Before we go, what, what is BERT, right? BERT, right? So BERT stands for Bidirectional Encoder Representation for Transformers. Don't worry too much about this. Uh, what BERT, BERT is, is a state-of-the-art model that uses an architecture called transformers. And what this model does, it, it can encode language and it can entail context with it, the way it does. It's a, uh, it's, I cannot go into details on how it works because that would take more than a half hour for me to explain. Uh, but I want you to trust me, that's a state-of-the-art model and they are more advanced than those language embeddings we've saw. They get way better results. They were trained with lots and lots of data. They are trained with so much data that th this data is not even, uh, It's we don't do like, proper supervised learning anymore. We do self-supervised learning, which is the model, we give some information about the data, but the model keeps playing by himself. For example, it will hide parts of a sentence during training, and the label of that is the full sentence. So the model will try to predict what's hidden 
in the text so it can learn context of why some words are in a place or another. So the BERT, BERT, uh, the BERT models are absurdly smart in terms of training and they use a lot of data. They are much bigger models. And if you want to do something more, let's say professional, something more, with, more impactful, you kind of will need to use those models, right? Uh, they are, as I said, state-of-the-art NLP models. And if you need some more validation, they are used on Google search. So you can imagine that Google search is absurdly try. It's one place where understanding your query is absurdly important, right? How do you understand exactly what you want to find? So BERT models help the search engine to understand what you're trying to find. Even sometimes you write some random things and you get exactly what you wanted. How does it do that? That's because it's powered by absurdly advanced uh, NLP models, right? Let's go and understand what's available in terms of BERT on TensorFlow Hub. Uh, there is a lot of them, a lot of BERT models. They, for example, we have the traditional BERT, which was the, uh, the, the that came from the first paper. All you need is, is attention. Uh, and we have the, those there. If you, Those work very well for baselines. So you do a model using them. And that's, that's a good result. And then you can try to improve using other BERT models. Uh, you can try to improve in terms of size. You can try to improve in terms of accuracy. That's why we have small BERTs. They, are, they try to do the same thing, but with less per parameters. So they are smaller. We have Albert, which is like a light version. Uh, they they try to to be more uh, considerate in terms of uh, size. Here we have Bert experts, which were are Bert models that are trained with on specific domains, right? So we have a Bert for uh, I guess uh, health uh, uh, health items, uh, uh, magical magical terms. We have another for a bunch of them. You can take a look on on the Bert collection. So those Bert experts, they are. Aside from being fine tunable, you can use them directly for some uh, tasks because they already know specific details about specific corpus of data. We have Electra and Talking Heads, and of course Lamberts, which are even more specialized birds with all state of the art. Those are like from there are some that are from last year publishing. Uh, they are absurdly new, so it's something that you. Uh, it's uh, what researchers are doing there. It's here. It's available to you. Uh, one, but then there is one challenge here. When we talk about BERT models, I don't know how much you know that, they they expect a specific kind of input. And this specific kind of input is uh, something that sometimes it's hard to understand. I'll try to go over some details here. So they expect you to give uh, these three things. You get your text, you will convert your text to input word IDs, input mask, input type IDs. This will explain to your to your BERT model uh, which words you're using, uh, in which context they are, kind of, and which sentences you're giving. So BERT models are very good to deal with multiple sentences being compared. Like, for example, if you, sentence A uh, is similar to sentence B, or if sentence A is a question to the sentence B, B is an answer to sentence A, the same thing. So that's why there's multiple sentences and these input type IDs, mask and stuff helps you explain to the model what you're trying to get from it. Uh, you can use something called BERT tokenizer to create this for you. And let's take a look on code, how things will go. First of all, we are with our we are using BERT models. So I got the URL from a BERT model from Hub, and now I will have to implement these things I told you, right? Uh, the problem with that is. When we do this token, it's a tokenizer, right? So we are going to convert text to a specific BERT input. The problem here is everywhere you deploy your model, this code has to go with you. You have to have that code. If you deploy this model on the browser, this mod, this code will have to be on the browser, probably converted from Python to JavaScript. Uh, if you have to put on your server, this code for converting text to the proper inputs, we have to go with you to the server. If you go to a mobile device, same thing. So this starts to become a problem, right? Uh, it's a little bit annoying. And this makes, there's a lot of boilerplate code involved. And I don't like that. I'm absurdly lazy in terms of that. I want things to be easy. And that's why we have uh, pre-processed models for 
BERT. And what the preprocess model is, it's a clever thing. It's a model, it's a machine learning model that the only thing they know is how to convert your text to what BERT expects. So it's, it's a model that just gets your text and converts to what uh, BERT expects. So uh, technically, it's like a translator, right? It's a person that's beside you translate to another, not someone else. And these preprocessing models, they help you avoid all these boilerplate codes. Uh, they can be, they know already, they have, of course, for each birch model, we have one preprocess model. It is based on your vocabulary. So if you're doing English, there is a preprocess for birch English. Uh, and if you're doing Albert instead of just Bert, as I mentioned, there's on the top, there's a preprocess for Albert because it's it works a little bit different for inputs. So it helps you with this conversion easily. Let's see how it works. So here I'm using, uh, oh, sorry, the, for the, I forget to change the first URL, but uh, luckily this also works exactly. So I'm, I'm using a different BERT model, whatever, uh, but the preprocess model associated with that is still the same. Uh, so we can see here, Oh, sorry, uh, let me restart here. Sorry, a mistake here. Same thing, uh, okay, we've got here, nice. And now we have our handle to the BERT module and our handle to the preprocess module. We have both of them. How do we use this? And now it's the magic. First of all, we create an input layer for strings. This will lead to our preprocess model. So our string go inside of our preprocess model the output of our preprocess layer, as you can see on the line, uh, goes to encoder inputs. These will be used now on our BERT model. BERT it's a, it's the encoder, right? It will translate whatever it has to proper uh, numbers that we need later. And that's where we are going to use our BERT uh, handle, model handle over there. We are going to, uh, the BERT model, whenever you run it, it outputs a bunch of things. One of them, which is exactly what we want right now, is called pulled output. So it's, an, uh, it's a key in the map that comes back. This pulled output, we are going to use a dropout and a dense layer. And we are going we are, here we are creating, again, a sentiment analysis. Uh, as you can see, of course, the model is a little bit more complex, a little bit. But if you look deep, uh, the preprocessing and the BERT part, they are basically the language embedding we used before. Right, that's kind of the same thing. And then we have the last layer. From here, we create the model, compile, fit, and we are getting a better model just by doing that. Uh, of course, it's more complex, but you didn't do much more, right? Technically, the data is the same. Uh, it will take longer to train because these models are more advanced, but you get better results also. If you want, there is this sample uh, right there on the bottom, right? that goes over all the details for you. So you can go into all the details. And this is a full BERT solution to NLP, just like that. You're doing sentiment analysis with state-of-the-art models. If you want some more examples, this URL will help you. Uh, I'm, I'm having to pay attention to my time, sorry. This will help you. And let's see a little bit more in detail how TensorFlow Hub library works. Uh, that code that we've just seen there, uh, load, and do some embedding, same thing we've seen. What the, What's happening right here? Whenever you uh, call load, the model will be downloaded from TensorFlow Hub's repository. It will be downloaded to a temp directory in your machine. It's compressed, so it will be uncompressed to a temp directory. You can change that temp directory uh, defining this uh, OS environment variable. Uh, you might need that because you might want to get this model and convert to TensorFlow Lite, for example. You need to know where the model is. Usually, you don't need to know where the model is because you load and you use, and that's it, right? But if you need to know, you can, uh, first of all, you, there's a method called hub.resolve, which will tell you where the model is, but you usually don't need that. Uh, you can also define the place if you want to do some more fancy things here. And given it's on your machine now, uh, it, it, it extracts there, it then doesn't need to download anymore. So next time you call hub.load, it will, oh, is it? 
uh, local already. Oh, yes, it is. Let me load directly from the local file system. So this gets faster for the second time. Sorry, I thought it was a message from the organization. And aside from that, we also have uh, TensorFlow supports a lot of other things, uh, TensorFlow.js, TensorFlow Lite, as my friend in the previous session was talking, TensorFlow Lite with metadata, with everything that you need to use your modules on device. And one last thing that we should pay attention is, uh, okay, those modules of TensorFlow Hub, are, who contributes to them? It's powered by the community. So of course, there's a lot of Google models there as expected from DeepMind, from Google, from TensorFlow team, all of those are there. But not only that, we have other companies that publish models. We have the community that publish models, Kaggle competitors publish models, GDE publish models, you can publish a model. So if you want to publish a model, you can follow this URL. Uh, it's, uh, it's not the best one to read, but it's at least it's short, right? Uh, and this, you can contribute your own models. If you, have, if you think you have a good model that is, is worth is worth sharing with your friends or the community, please go and publish. You have your page, you can write a documentation sample, all of that have the same inf information that's available to all the other models. So uh, this is basically it. Please use TensorFlow Hub, uh, go visit the site. You'll definitely learn some cool things there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luis, it was great. And thank you for uh, participation in our event. We will take your words into practice because you have uh, covered all essential elements. So let's continue with a question. Uh, Ulve has asked why there is no BERT for Azerbaijan language in Hungary. It's not so the yeah, I completely understand that. Uh, but the problem is it's hard to to create a model for BERT in specific language because of the data set. It has to be a huge data set. It's not like the IMDB reviews, right? It has yeah. to be a lot. So the main challenge is usually people don't have enough data to train a proper BERT model with good results. And it's not only for Azerbaijani, just learn that. Yeah. It's not only for that, it's for there are other languages uh, we what we do is we help with tools for anyone to train their own BERT models. We have the code on model gardening, which is uh, the source code for all those BERT models. Uh, you can follow there's scripts to just uh, to use the same architecture with your data. Of course, it takes a while to train, but you can do that. And I I'm working to have to improve that. Thanks for uh, bring that up. I'm working to improve. Uh, more languages, bringing more models to more languages to TensorFlow Hub to make this easier. I completely agree that multilingual might not be good enough for a lot of languages, but it's a hard problem. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to document how to do that. Uh, how for how can you uh, convert your for your own language and then publish to Hub? Because then you're helping the rest of the community, which is for me is the most important part, right? Helping your fellow. Uh, citizens to friends to use what you did and solve also NLP for them. Thanks. Any more questions? Okay. No. Once again, would like to thank you for such wonderful speech, and uh, I hope to get a chance to be with you in our future events as well. Uh, I hope so. Uh, it's sad that we cannot go anywhere, <laughs> but mm -hmm. maybe in the future, maybe we will all be in the same place talking about cool stuff. Okay. See you. See you later. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. How's it going? Hello. Hey, how's it going? Can you hear me all right? Sounds good. Can you hear me? Yeah, I think our connection's a little slow, but I can I can hear you. It's just a little delayed.
So our next speaker is Josh. He works on the TensorFlow team at Google. So today he will speak about Zero to Hero with TensorFlow. And if you are interested in machine learning and you are just fresh, didn't know how to where to start, it's just for you. Okay, let's start. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. So I think this talk is a zero to hero talk. And so what I will do is assume that you're brand new to TensorFlow. And if you haven't, um, and I'll assume you haven't written in neural network before. And my goal is just to show you the easiest possible way to start writing code. And what I'd like to mention off the bat is that there's a lot of different areas of machine learning. And deep learning, which is what TensorFlow is for, is by far the most complicated. And it's totally cool if um, you're going through some of our beginner tutorials and all of the terms don't make sense right away. It usually takes a few months, you know, uh, like Gus was saying, for things like sigmoid or different types of gradient descent optimizers or whatever, for all the terms to click. But the goal of today's uh, screencast is just to help you dive in and get started. So basically, um, what I'll do is I'll I'll walk you through one of our tutorials that will help you write a neural network. And the place to go to get started is tensorflow.org. And then once you're on tensorflow.org, you can click Get Started with TensorFlow, and then click on See Tutorials. Another way to get to this URL is tensorflow.org slash tutorials. And there's lots of different stuff here. And the truth is there's there's basically um, two ways to work with TensorFlow. One is using the high-level APIs. And I'm in the basic classification tutorial. And this will show you how to build a neural network with a few lines of code. And that's what we'll walk through today. Another thing, another way to learn TensorFlow is if you click on Guide, and then you click on things like Tensor, these guides are little book chapters. And they'll explain like what a tensor is, what a gradient is, and some of the mechanics and how TensorFlow works under the hood. But for today, we're going to look at the tutorials. And by tutorials, we really mean like end-to-end -end code examples. So let's check out basic image classification. And if you've never seen uh, this tutorial before, let me just make it a little bit bigger so it's easier for you to see. All of the tutorials on tensorflow.org, you can download them as Jupyter Notebooks on GitHub or you can run them in Google Colab. And if you're new to this, I think you'll really, really like it. Uh, Colab, it's a free Jupyter Notebook environment, and it comes with a free GPU. And I'm just gonna close the table of contents. And it's a really great, great way to write and run code. And you know, if you're ever working with, um, maybe you're teaching a class yourself, or maybe you're you know, working at a meetup or with some high school students or college students or anything like that, this is a great way for them to get started too, because it's totally free. Everyone has a GPU, it's easy. To turn on a GPU, you can go to edit and then notebook settings, and you can go to hardware accelerator and you wanna select a GPU. And TPUs are also available, but they're a little bit harder to use. So for right now, we'll use a GPU. And then you can click on connect. And if you hover over connect, What's happening is we're connected to a, um, a free virtual machine on Google Cloud Platform. And you have root access to it, so you can install software. So this is just a Jupyter Notebook. And if we make a code cell, in the code cell, you can run uh, Linux commands. So I can do ls or pwd, and you can see that you know, the current directory I'm in is content. And if you want, um, you, know, you can upload files to this. There's a little file system here that you can upload with a GUI. And there's cool things like code snippets here. If you wanted to, you can connect this to Google Drive so you can upload files from your drive or save files to your drive. Anyway, it's a really nice environment. But let's take a look at this tutorial. And um, I will step through it and see if I can uh, explain things as we go. So TensorFlow is a, um, it's a Python library with a C++ backend for speed. And we're importing it. And one thing to know about these deep neural network libraries is they change pretty frequently as we learn how to make them easier to use. And so uh, this is the latest version, and that's great. And then we get into, um, finally, some <laughs> machine learning. So machine learning is a fancy way of saying that we're programming with data. And the idea is to write uh, one program that you can customize with data to solve many different problems. And an example of that is an image classifier. So 
a neural network is a type of machine learning model. And um, it's a model, in this case, that can take an image's input and predict the type of image's output. So the data set we'll work with, and machine learning always starts with data. And the data set we'll work with here is called Fashion MNIST. And it has 70,000 pictures of, of uh, grayscale uh, clothing. So each, pixel, each picture is really tiny. It's like 28 by 28 pixels. And that's just so it fits into memory and we can train this model quickly. And if you look, it looks like that's a skirt. That looks like a t-shirt to me. Different kinds of t-shirts. I can't quite see it. Maybe some pants. And the goal is we're going to give it a, um, a picture from this data set, and it's going to predict the label. So this picture is a shirt, or this picture is a pair of jeans, or whatever. And um, you always start your machine learning programs with a data set. And this is a famous data set, so it's, it's built into TensorFlow. And so we can load it by executing this uh, code cell. And you can do that by pressing Shift, Enter, or hitting Play. And data sets always have two things. And machine learning is kind of like a game. You get the training data and the training labels. And the training images here, they're the pictures, obviously. And the label is basically a number that tells you what article of clothing it is. So like zero could be jeans, and one could be a t-shirt, and two could be a sock, or whatever. And you use these to train your model. Then there's another data set in an identical format called the testing data set. And we use this to see how accurate our model is. And um, basically, um, the first like three quarters of this tutorial mostly goes over poking around with the data set and helping you understand the format. And you can definitely try this at home just to make it easier to read because the, um, the labels only have numbers. We're adding uh, some strings that just tell us what those numbers correspond to. And this is to make it easier for us to plot it. And then you can poke around with the shape of the data. And what this is telling us is there's 60,000 images in the training set. And um, each of which is 28 uh, by 28 pixels. So it's 60,000 images. And likewise, every image has a label. So here there's 60,000 labels. Um, we can also take a peek and see like uh, what the format of the labels is. And here we can see that the first label is a nine. And that tells us that the first image from a data set corresponds to the ninth index here. And um, we start from zero for computer science, silly reasons. So that's 0, 1, 2, 3, and that's 9. So the first image is an ankle boot. Likewise, we can poke around at the test images. And we see we have 10,000 of those. And of course, every test image also has a label. And this is just called poking around with the data. If um, uh, A lot of it's in NumPy format. And NumPy is a Python library for working basically with matrices and things like that. The next thing we can do is we can print out some of the images. And we're printing out the first image from the training set. And the reason the colors are a little funky, this is called a color map. And um, right now, the pixel values range between 0 and 255. And if, if we normalize them, which just means rescaling them so they range between 0 and 1, then we can plot it, and it will look a little uh, cleaner. So here we're going to, um, and this is happening over the entire matrix. So what we're doing is for every one of those 60,000 images, we're dividing it all the pixels by 255. So now they range between 0 and 1. And here we can we can plot some of the um, images from the data set now. And they look, they look a little bit more normal. And we can see um, the image. And we've looked up the, uh, the string label. And so you can, you can see um, what it means as opposed to just looking at the number. And then finally, we get to develop a neural network. And this is the part that's a little bit tricky. Um, if you're interested in how these neural networks work, I just put up a talk on our YouTube channel, um, I think two days ago. And if you go to youtube.com slash TensorFlow, you can click on this very first video up top. And um, this video, it's a little bit long, um, and it moves a little bit faster, a lot faster than what we're doing today. But um, it has little diagrams of exactly what neural networks are. So you can see, um, and it will it will walk you through building something like this and explaining what the pieces are. And basically, um, what we're going to build in this tutorial is a little neural network that takes an image as input. And the idea is that each of these uh, squares on the top here um, corresponds to one of the pixels from uh, one of the images in our data set. 
And each of these circles corresponds to a neuron. And the circles on the very bottom are the ones that classify the data. So basically, the lines represent a, a learnable weight. And the idea kind of is that the, um, the pixels flow through this model. And each of these output circles or neurons gets a score. And we classify the image as the output with the highest score. So for example, um, if we take a look at our, um, our labels, It looks like, um, okay, so a t-shirt is label zero. So that t-shirt would correspond to um, this circle here on the left. Anyway, a neural network is composed of layers. And the more layers you add, the more powerful the model is. And um, um, although these are a little bit complex, what's really interesting is the, um, the code is not too bad. So basically, let me just modify this really quickly. So you see here, there's three layers, one, two, and three. <clears throat> and um, that's called a deep neural network. And the code I have here defines a model that's very similar to what you're seeing here. And anyway, um, let me explain what some of these numbers mean. So let me make this as simple as possible to start. The most common type of layer in neural networks is a layer called dense. And a dense layer, it's also called a fully connected layer. That's what you see here. Um, every neuron is connected to every neuron in the layer above it. So um, dense layers, though, they're also very basic. And they can only take um, arrays as input. They don't know how to handle uh, square images. So here, there's a special type of layer called flatten. And what flatten does, it basically takes an image, and it unrolls that image, that square image, into an array. And that's what we're seeing up top with this, with this square image. And then it goes through the dense layers, and then we classify the data. And if I'll show you how this looks in action. So here we have a model with just one layer. And here we're defining the model, but we're not, we're not training it. So now our model's defined. The next um, step with neural networks, they're all trained by gradient descent. And there's many different types of gradient descent optimizers that use fancy things like momentum and adaptive learning rates or whatever. But the good news is there's a really powerful one called Atom. And this is almost always the right choice. So it's, a, it, yeah, basically for your gradient descent optimizers, you can use basically the default is Atom and you can use that. The next part is a little complicated. And whenever we train a, um, a machine learning model, we need something called a loss function. And loss is a really fancy word for error. And the idea is that um, we want to minimize error and uh, the mistakes, error is the mistakes the model makes when it's classifying images. And we minimize the error by training the model using gradient descent. And this looks a little complicated, but the truth is there's only four or five of these things. And as you study this stuff, um, you'll learn the details. And they're very similar to things like you might have heard before, like mean squared error um, or mean average error. This categorical cross-entropy thing is just a fancy loss function that's used for classification. Anyway, um, after we define the model, we can train it. And the good news is that training is, is the simplest part of this. So we call model.fit, and we give it the training images and the training labels. And the idea is that all of the weights in the model, and these lines represent the learnable weights, they all start as randomly initialized numbers. So the accuracy is initially very low. And an epoch, this roughly tells us how long we're training the model for. And what's happening when we're training the model is we're classifying an image, we're getting a prediction, which are usually wrong at first. Then we compute our error, and then we gradually tweak the weights in the network to make the prediction more accurate with time. And um, you can see that this is the accuracy on the training set. And as we train the model, the accuracy gradually increases. Usually, the next step is after you've trained the model, you want to see how accurate it is. And this is the game in machine learning. The goal is to get it as accurate as possible on the testing data set. And the intuition is that, like, um, you know, this could be if you actually, let's say, you know, you're like a clothing store. And for some reason, you wanted to use this model to classify data. Usually, you're using the model on images that you, you've never seen before, like new clothing that's coming in. 
and you want to estimate how well your model will work on new data. And that's what the test set is supposed to do. So the images in the test set were not used to train the model. They're just used to estimate accuracy. And then you can see the accuracy on the test set, and that's commonly a little bit lower than the accuracy on the training set. And that's because the model is doing something called overfitting, which basically means it's, um, it's been fit too tightly to the training data. And if you're interested in overfitting, you can go back to tensorflow.org slash tutorials, and there's one on overfitting and underfitting and concepts like that that you can, you can check out. Anyway, um, there's other things you can do too. So um, this model was written in a slightly more complicated way than it needs to, but it, it demonstrates some powerful things in TensorFlow. And if we wanted to modify our model so it returns probabilities, so you could classify an image and see the probabilities that correspond to different um, uh, labels, you can modify the model like this. So we're taking our existing model and we're adding, um, this is called an activation function and it modifies the output of the model. Um, and softmax is a fancy way of saying, please return me probabilities. And if we classify all of the images in the test set, so here we're taking every image in the test set and we're asking the model to predict the label, then we can print out some of the predictions. And this is the first one. And what these um, E negative uh, 07 is saying is these are, this is scientific notation. And these numbers are very, very, very small. And we'd classify the image as the highest one of these, which to me looks like this one, because that just has one decimal point. And we can find the highest one using NumPy. And there's a function here called argmax, which means maximum argument. It just finds the index of the number that's largest. And if we print that out, you'll see that uh, the model thinks the first image is a nine. And then we can see if that was correct or incorrect by printing out the label of the first image. And we can see that that was a nine. And so that tells us that our model got that one right, which is pretty cool. And then here's a bunch of, um, the reason this is long is this is just a bunch of plotting code in matplotlib. And what we're going to do is define a function. Let's see what it looks like. This is just more plotting code. Yeah. so. We're printing out the image, and then we're printing out the model's predictions. And this is pretty cool. You can see that the model is pretty confident that we're looking at a nine. And it's it's usually machine learning models are a little bit uncertain. And so it also thinks it might be a five or a seven. And you can you can scroll up to those class labels to figure out what those um what those correspond to. And um, here we're looking at an example that the model got wrong. And you can see that it thought it was a five, but I, I believe really it was a seven. And these models make lots of mistakes. Um, and this is some more plotting code. A really important skill too is like inspecting, uh, you know, your model and your data and your accuracy to see how well it's working. Machine learning is it's really experimental, and oftentimes you'll you know try different neural networks and you'll try different data sets or larger data sets to see how that affects your accuracy. And then um, there's some more code that shows you how to poke around with the model in the bottom. And just one last thing I'd like to show you is that. If you want to try um, different types of neural networks, this is actually a linear model. And it's doing, um, you know, if you've taken like a, a math class, this is basically um, multi, it's like multi-class logistic regression, which sounds fancier than I want it to. Um, but what you can do is if you add a single layer, um, now you have something called a neural network. And the basic idea is that the more layers you have, the more powerful the model is. Meaning like the fancier, it, it can learn more complicated images, um, but it also can be slower to train. And typically larger models, they can also overfit a little bit more. And you can learn about that um, in the other tutorials. And just so you know, every layer but the last one has to have something called, and this called an activation function. And this basically helps the layers uh, learn patterns from data. And you know what you can do, I think our accuracy last time was like 88%. But if you change the model, and every time you change the model, you have to rerun that cell to define it. You have to rerun the cell to compile it. And you have to rerun the cell to train it. But now that we have a neural network, if you retrain it, um, the accuracy will most likely be a little higher because we have a more powerful model. And you can see already our last model was like, I don't know, like 80 something percent. And this one might get to like 90 something. So the good news is deep learning, it's um, there's a lot of like really fancy like terms and stuff like categorical cross entropy, 
that you know you can study and those those take everyone a little while but um the code itself is relatively uh concise which is nice um so basically if you're new to this stuff a good place to start is this machine learning basics with keras collection and keras is um it's tensorflow's high level api so it's the easiest way to define neural networks you can poke around with this stuff and that's a great way to um, get started and then if you want some book recommendations at the very end of this video um, it's the first one on youtube.com slash tensorflow. I talk about a couple different books that might be helpful to you depending on your, um, your goals. So I think, I think that's all I have for today and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Josh, for this amazing uh, presentation. We hope, we hope you will consent to speak to us again. And I'm grateful for your time you spent in careful preparation of this present. So we have a question, and I, I will be happy if you answer. So if we have asked that I have been working uh, deep learning models for a while now, and I saw that in academic site, PyTorch is surprising TensorFlow. And I think the rest of question is that uh, some academic people say that by towards to be easy to debug. What's the plan to target that market on the Google side? Yeah, so there are many deep learning libraries and PyTorch is a really excellent library out of Facebook. Um, there's another really excellent library out of Google called JAX. And JAX is really outstanding for advanced research. Um, basically, all of these libraries are new and they're constantly changing. And over time, as we learn basically how we can make them uh, more helpful to users. We work on them to make them easier to use. And so we've been investing a lot of time in making uh, TensorFlow yeah. easier to debug and more hackable as well, and stuff like that. And these these libraries, they're always changing very fast. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, What will happen if there's a big difference between train and tens accuracy? How can we reduce it? Yeah, that's an, that's an excellent question. And that happens a lot. And um, it's actually one of the most important things in machine learning, because basically, if you define a really large neural network and you train it for a long time, you might get like 100% accuracy on your training set. But the problem is, if that model is super accurate on the training set, it might actually be really bad on the test set, which means you know when you actually use it in your clothing store, it doesn't work. <laughs> and um, if you check out this overfitting and underfitting tutorial, it explains a couple different strategies. One strategy is basically get more data. More data is always good. And then there's special types of layers you can use. There's things like dropout, which regularize the network. Um, you can also use a smaller model, like smaller neural networks have more trouble overfitting. And there's, you can also use things like data augmentation. And um, there's a really nice example of that in the image classification tutorial. And basically, this trains a model that overfits really badly. And then it uses these different techniques to address overfitting. So it uses data augmentation, and it uses dropout. And it walks you through the process of sort of fixing the model so it works much better. And um, you can find this tutorial, it's under, um, it's a really nice one. It's under advanced and then images and then image classification. Thank you for your answer. And our last question is that collapse session time is quite short. Is Google planning to make it longer? Yeah, so that's a great question. So Colab is meant for interactive use. And I think um, the VMs reset, I want to say every 12 hours or so, but I'm not exactly sure. And they will disconnect. Like um, if you're training a very large model and you walk away from it, it will disconnect. Um, but it's good for interactive. There is a way to get a uh, longer session time. And this is totally optional. And you definitely don't have to do this to use Colab. But you can sign up for um, Colab Pro. And um, if you go to Colab Pro, um, it gives you, um, and again, you don't ever have to pay for this. It's only if you're interested you get basically a longer session time and you get um, priority access to the faster um, machines. And what's really nice, it's, um, it's about $10 a month. 
Um, I'm not sure which countries this is available in yet. It's pretty new and they're working on expanding it. But if you're interested, I would keep your eye on this because although I never want students to have to pay for anything, 10 bucks a month is it's an excellent deal and it's much cheaper than getting a virtual machine on a, on a cloud platform, which can be hundreds of dollars a month. So Colab Pro is, it looks pretty cool. Um, but again, totally, totally optional. Yeah. Thank you for your time and uh, your answers. Sure thing. Thank you very much. See you. Bye. Yes, guys, I hope you are enjoying our slides. So please share our event because the more you share, the more people uh, will be able to join and be able to learn. And also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. And our next speaker is Omid Safarzata, who is the lead of data science at uh, the International Bank of Azerbaijan. So he will speak about the cutting its research in uh, let's continue. Hello, thanks Hello. a lot for having me here. Do you hear me? Yes, yes. Very. Okay, great. Uh, so let me find my presentation as well. Sorry. Uh, Just a second, sorry. Okay. I think we are ready. Do you see? Do we have it? Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, this is Umid Safarzadeh, lead data scientist at uh, International Bank of Azerbaijan. Uh, today, uh, I would like to talk about cutting edge research in TensorFlow. Thanks a lot for having me in your session. Uh, unlike the other speakers today, I would like to go a little bit, a little bit deeper in theory there is a new model developed by google team and some one scholar uh, from uh, stanford uh, the model is really interesting and let's go, go i would like also uh, to discuss that model with you guys uh, if, of course everybody here is already uh, familiar with the multiple linear regression with interactions so in, when, when we talk about the interaction, assuming that you have several features, that is x1, x2, to xn, then you have interaction terms which, which are x1 multiplied by x2. Also, we, if you may remember that we, in this basic statistics, we also have polynomial uh, of degree n uh, regression types, which you increase the number, uh, the power of the each feature till n. So the question is uh, how we can have similar models in using TensorFlow. Uh, there is also other challenge here that uh, this model helps to to helps you to figure it out uh, how to solve that uh, problem is cross uh, how to learn uh, cross features and how to uh, what the, the problem we already have here is, uh, let's say, assuming that if you have you are working with the categorical variables and you are, let's say, you are developing web scale applications, which are like you have a lot of uh, categorical variables. Let's let's consider city and neighborhood names of all the all the all the cities in the world. Then you will have if what we do in the 
data science, we prepare one hot encoding. Uh, if you are not familiar with one hot encoding, let's assume I give you one example at here on the screen, and you can see that assuming that your your categorical variable you have in your categorical variable you have nine elements. Let's say man, woman, boy, and etc. etc. Et then your one hot encoding matrix will be something like nine by nine by nine matrix, which is uh, uh, identical matrix, and you have a lot of zeros here. In case of using the city and neighborhood names, then this one hot encoding you may end up with one thousand, ten thousand, or even more by ten thousand matrices. So this is large and uh, sparse feature space. Today we had the chance to learn from Gus and uh, that he introduces uh, us uh, 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 vector spaces in NLP, um, which is coming from the Mikulov's 2013 paper. He was that time in the Google team as well. Uh, so he, the word vectors are, in a, are a way of understanding text. Uh, and converting them to word embeddings. Here, if the question is how can I use uh, those uh, word embeddings in the uh, in converting my uh, word categorical variables and avoid a larger space uh, word vector represent one hot encoding representations. So one simple way here is using word vectors, as assuming that your word vectors, let's say, is considered 32, then you have more meaningful word vectors representing those categorical variables. Another uh, positive side of using word embeddings is uh, you have meaningful, uh, you might have, you will have similarity between the vocabulary, then like, which we, we don't have it in 100 hot encoding, especially in the categorical variables. The, let's say man and woman in semantic meaning side, they are very similar in the meaning, uh, and boy and girl are also similar in the meaning. They're also close to man and woman. Uh, a little bit far away with queen, but queen and king also, they're also close to each other. Same as prince and prince, pr princess. Uh, one hot encoding doesn't capture that, but word embeddings already capture that. We know all of these in NLP. The question is, how am I going to use it in web application, web scale applications, and let's say recommendation system? Uh, today, uh, uh, Sergi also introduced us TensorFlow recommendation system uh, models, which is new in the uh, TensorFlow that Assume that you're going to have prepare a recommendation system based, based on thousands of movies and, or based on thousands of uh, users and some, we just kept uh, learning some people, movies name, you might capture what some of the, the names of them are already similar to each other in the, and you, they might also indicate not ex explicitly, implicitly, or, but explicitly they might indicate some similarity between the movies name. So one problem, one uh, advantage of this model, one challenge is that one. The other one was how to create feature engineering, uh, how to do the feature engineering automatically. The, in 2017, there is a great paper published by Wang from Stanford and the others from the Google team. And uh, in 2020, for, I think it was February 2020, one year ago, uh, they, they published second version of the same model uh, with a little bit some uh, modifications. And uh, in that paper, in this paper, they introduced a new structure. They call it cross network structures, uh, in the, in, which are which are also uh, uh, new structure for using. Uh, to learn a newest model structure to learn feature engineering part. Uh, DCNs, let's call them, call deep, deep and cross networks from now on DCNs. DCNs 
consider high polyno highest polyno polynomial degrees as well. The network consists of all the cross terms of degree up to the highest with their coefficients all different. This is also very helpful for interpreting the effect of higher degrees of polyno uh, feature, poly uh, polynomial, uh, polynomial or higher degree of the input features to in, uh, in the model. If you are using just neural network, most of the time you cannot interpret the highest degrees of the higher degrees of the input vector, input features, because you are using some functions over that, which is like let's say sigmoid or softmax or relevant functions, which makes them hard to interpret. So let's check how the model look like. I will go to the, this uh, graph. As you can see, in this graph, we have embedding and stacking layer here as an input. Then we will have cross network. Then we will have deep neural network. Then we will have a stack demand. Uh, we will have the output and for, uh, last uh, neural network to, uh, to predict. This is what they, they proposed in 2017. In 2019, 2020, they stack this one over. And we will see both of them. We will go through the details. So the structure is, as I just said, it is input layer, which is typically an embedding layer here. But I will discuss what I mean embedding layer because we, you don't have just categorical variables. You also have dense, as they say it in the paper, dense features, or let's call them numerical variables that we already know. A cross network com contains multiple cross layers and which implies that we can have explicit feature interactions. This is very helpful. Networks for making inter some interpretations of uh, our, mod our model outputs as well, and inputs of the model and their effect of the output. Deep neural network, you already know, this is like implicit features interactions. Uh, so here, and now, okay, here we, before jumping to next, so I, I, would, I would like to explain this, uh, this is from directly from the paper. Uh, uh, here, the orange uh, guys here, the orange uh, circles here, they are showing the dense features, dense features, or memory core features you're already familiar with. Maybe it's like something related to time related or something related. Those are that we, in the mathematically, we say, we say they are a member of the real, uh, uh, real numbers. And these are the categoricals, the green, green uh, uh, circles here. And these are, let's say, if you have several categorical uh, variables, you all, all combine them. Uh, you are, uh, for each one of them, you make one embedding here. You will see this in the model structure soon as well, and how to do it as well. But as here also, you, you, can, as you can create several dimensions, several embeddings, uh, or with different embedding size. Let's say if you have a, like some category variables, there are just, let's say, four. Uh, vocabulary there. You you won't uh, expand them to like 32 dimension. You might just keep them in four dimension or two dimension if it is just female and male. But if you have a larger uh, uh, number of the feature, number of the members in the categorical variable, let's like, say like, uh, CTs and those stuff, you might want want to use the dimensional reduction of uh, way of uh, using embedding vectors. So this is totally on you. Unfortunately, in the code in the TensorFlow, it, these are all a little bit messy. So you might uh, cons you might refactor it and uh, look at it in the details by one, one by one by yourself for some if you are uh, creating your own model. And uh, so let's say in the in the TensorFlow, like in the page uh, TensorFlow page. The, he assumes them all of them in the same uh, format and the same dimension, all of them in 32. 
So you should be careful about that. On the left side, we have the cross network. We will explain what, what we mean about the cross network. In the right side, you have the deep network. In the embedding side, as we have, once we created the embeddings of all of them, then we concatenate all of the dense and the uh, embed categorical variables here. Let's look at that, well, how we're how we going to do that. So in the coding side, you have, uh, you can use self-embed layers, then you can loop over all the, or if you can, this is a loop, you can use it as a loop, or if you have all, you want to assume all the embedding uh, layers in the same uh, dimension, then you will have concatenate all the embedding layers at the end, if depends on how many embedding layers you want to have for each categorical variables. If they say you have 10 category variables and each one of them have different dimension, then you will at the end embed all of them and then you concatenate all of them. Then you will have uh, this represents the sparse embedding part. And then you will have, all, which is the same as the uh, categorical part. Then you have dense inputs as well. Then for the dense inputs, just you, you will have just use them directly and then concatenate them again. Then this gives you x here. x tensor x here is the same as x0 here. Now you have a tensor, a one dimensional di this, uh, dimension, it's in one dimensional tensor vector. Then you want to uh, fit these to two parallel networks. Let's look at the, the networks now. Let me go for first look at the deep neural network because this is an easy one. So you have the uh, dense, you already know how to create a neural network here, like dense neural network here. We, we in the code, it's like it using the introduces a class, but it's at the end, it's the same uh, dense layer in the class. It's nothing else, but he puts a loop here that if you want to have five, ten, or too many of them, how many, if, depends on how many, want, how many of them you want. The, the formulation is the same, it's not that in the literature. Let's go back. Then the question is how I'm going to create uh, cross networks. The cross network in the coding part is like first, of course, you expand the dimension of the inputs uh, as a x, x0. You create another layer, uh, same tensor. Yeah, as XL, then for the number of the layers you want, in the, uh, depends on how many layers you want, you make a loop over them, then you cross dot, uh, cr you calculate the dot, net, uh, dot tensor or like cross multiplication of them, each layer with X0. This is very important. So if you have X1, this you, the way you create X1, you take this one, x1, then you multiply by x0, which is your in input. Then you will have the its weight, which, which uh, your model should learn. The b is the same bias vector, you, which your model should learn. Then you use xl as a new. Also, this is like, let's say here, l is 1. This is you can see 0, x1, x1, then you have the function as well. So same for next, next, next layers as well. So each keep in mind that each time you are keeping the x0 constant here. So you are already multiplying this for each network. We will look at that again. Then, of course, you squeeze, uh, 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 squeeze the output of the, this loop, then you create the x0. So after that, once you have this uh, squeezing part and the, these cross networks and then you have the deep neural network part of course at the end of the structure you you what you need you need to concatenate them again so you use concatenation here again you create another x stack this is the total x or x stack tensor then of course now you need a prediction so you are, you stack all of them as a new tensor you, what you need is just simple uh, uh, neural network here, just simple dense layer here. Then you, here you can use just tf.nn and, and as a sigmoid function. Here is a sigmoid, but the prediction is just if it's zero and one, you can use any softmax or any function you want. If you have several labels to predict. 
So all in all in one, you have uh, this structure. Then, of course, when you have the cross model, you just give the input vectors, uh, input uh, inputs as a dense input and the sparse input, and then stuff is the same. So before the fitting part and compiling part is really uh, very like depends on the your model. Uh, in the TensorFlow page, they wanted to find the uh, use it for recommendation system, so they 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 use it for a score because of the as a matrix because uh, the imbalance data. The number of classes was also three. So depends on on you. It's all uh, depends on you uh, what how you gonna you. you uh, what is the model you want to, you want to use and how to fit the model and the validation the split and the stuff it's all uh, standard in the literature optimizations and nothing is changing as Josh also said you, you might use category compares or two as well so we will come back to that again uh, so in the deep cross network version two which is 2020 paper the same other, almost same others and some other scholars from Google, they decided to introduce another structure, which is very similar to that, the previous one. Here, they just, what they use is this, instead of like paralleling to networks to learn, they stack the cross network over the embedding layers of all X0, then they stack the deep neural network over that. So they claim that this structure might be better. If you are, you are interested, you might come up with some other layers here. You might, if you are using some, uh, you might come come up with the, like, oh, I, I want to use a convolutional neural network, STMs, or whatever, whatever. It's all all decided. It's a very new model. It's very great, and uh, there is a lot of opportunities to improve and publish papers and uh, get good findings. So let's go back again to understand what was the cross network because this is very the heart of this paper this is like very interesting part so let's put let's use some uh, i as zero in the first iteration so x zero i have i will have x zero which is the same as the player then i will have b which is bias vector then i will have uh, x zero here again then i have x zero multiplication with, with that dot multiplication this is cross this is Okay, what will I will have at the end? I will have x zero. If you distribute this x zero vector over the all of it, what you will get, you will have x zero multiplied by w unknown for x zero itself. So you have second order di di uh, polynomial di uh, features. Then you will have x b x zero plus another x zero. So these are the same. If you have, if you if you put uh, I as now you have x1. If you put I as one, then here is x1, which is you producing the previous uh, layer. B doesn't change. These, these are new vectors you should learn. Then you have x1 here as well. But x0 is constant here. So that means that in my model, every time I am using x0 as an input over all new generated x, x1s. If you are expert about uh, image processing, you might remember this uh, structure in residual, residual networks as well, or they call it ResNet. Basically, what you are doing, you are using X1 as a residual multiple, you are multiplying that with the X0 as input as well. So let's go back to the structure. That's the part you have here in each uh, layer. So. Basically, I'm incorporating x0 in my inputs over any new generated x1 and x2 to xl. De depends how many, what is your hyperparameter? It's like let's say three is in the in the in this image, uh, in this graph. And but uh, you might have you you just created several features with higher second degree, or you can go deeply third degree polynomial multiplication of them with the uh, interaction of the, with the x0 itself and other features of them. 
which is great, right? So with very simple structure, I can just create several features without doing a lot of going the, from the pain, uh, painful task of manually creating a lot of features myself. Creating a lot of manual feature engineering is very common in the distance scientists, data science for as you have, you can may, you may see in the Kaggle as well. So they use the same se second order feature interaction. The, the, the data already had it. So the to model higher order feature interactions, they stack multiple cross layers and use a multiple layer, multiple la multi layer cross network. The two models uh, they built are cross uh, and the deep deep neural network. For deep neural network, they use ReLU layers or ReLU uh, activation function. And they get great results. We will come back to under, what model understands. They get great, great results in terms of the accuracy. They use log loss here as a loss function. They found that the DCN, deep cross network, already has lower uh, uh, lower log loss or has better loss than deep uh, deep crossing networks, deep neural networks, uh, factorizing machine machines, and uh, logistic regression. This is reported in the first paper, 2017. There is another concern here: how many new parameters I'm introducing. It is interesting that the number of, in terms of the uh, number of parameters is also with the same old, uh, the memory budget, you get uh, lower accuracy, lower loss, lo loss function, lower loss results. And if you see here, DCN has lower parameters. So I even use less parameters here than Deep neural networks, if you, as you can see, this is great, right? So you have simple model structure, better, uh, uh, better, uh, less parameters to estimate, better accu accuracy in terms of the like, uh, better loss fun loss log loss, right? So let's go back. So the question is, what model learn? Okay. Now you the weight matrix in DCN, especially the cross networks, reveals the what features crosses, and the model has learned to be, uh, which is very important. Okay, the importance of the interactions between the I and J features is captured by I J element of the that one matrix here. The feature embedding are sized thirty two instead of one, so basically here. I can have, especially if you are using the recommendation systems, uh, if you, instead of, let's say, if you have millions of the movies, uh, like IMDb model, in the TensorFlow page that they use this recommendation system, they are using this DCN, they already have like 1,600 movies and like 1,600 almost the same users, but the interaction between the these 1,000 and 1,000 and the preferences, you will end up like hundred thousands of the features. Then the, the question is how to learn those. Uh, and with this dimensional reduction, automatic uh, learning the features, uh, you can have better model to, for let's say web scale uh, recommendation systems. There's something here I just want to show you. So, for example, this is a sample model. Let's say you can have three different uh, models, three different embedding, uh, or we use three different embedding layers here. Yeah, each one of them represents one categorical variable. Here I still use 32, 32, 32, but you might reduce them or increase them. It's up to you. Then I also have three input for uh, some other uh, type of dense and or maybe time related data. Then I already con con concatenate them, all of them. Then you will have input layer with uh, all these. 
uh, because you have three embeddings, then you have concatenation of the those all of them together. With these three is are regarding to these three tensors, which are dense. Uh, this 96 comes from the concatenation of all embedding layers, as we discussed. Then at the end, we have 99. Uh, input dimension. Then cross network will have this. I will give them to a cross network. Similarly, I will give them some. Uh, give them to a deep neural network. At the end, I will concatenate them. My dimension increases to 103. Then I will have a dense layer to predict. Then you have a softmax here. I use softmax because I had three layers there. So, like total number of parameters are here, three thousand, almost three thousand. So, depend of the your the model you want, you can increase, and then of course this will increase. But the embedding layer will help you to de to and decreases the size of the sparse matrices here you have. That's it. Uh, if someone has any question, please ask. This is the, I, I didn't go for too much in the detail of the coding part because the coding part is already available in the uh, deep and cross network. I don't know if you can see my uh, page here, the, the my browser, but uh, just type uh, deep and cross network. Uh, you will find it in the TensorFlow page. It's, it has a great tutorial on the call app. If, if someone has any question, I'm happy to Help. So we have some questions. First of them is which companies recommend them based on TensorFlow? I mean, I think it means uh, in which type of companies needs recommended systems. It's based on TensorFlow. Uh, uh, the TensorFlow recommendation system is very new, so I don't know which companies are already using that. But recommendation system is already everywhere in the old web page, and uh, it started from the Spotify, Netflix are already great. They have great recommendation systems. Spotify has a great one. These are the big in the market, and they have a, they have a lot of contributions. But of course, you can start with the recommendation system with several companies. There are a lot of marketplaces that they are using the recommendation system. Depends on the, what the algorithm they are using. All guys are using collaborative filtering. You want maybe they might use an inter information retrieval plus this DCM. The, the collaborate collab, collab of the like the the collab page and the TensorFlow page is already using. Information retrieval for and uh, recommending uh, and the DCN for a proposed model. Sergi explains some part of it. So our next question is that: Can you please give more information about advantages of deep cross networks? Yeah, like I just showed. I just showed in the slides, right? You have two advantages. One in the same. In you have mem you have memory efficient. You are memory efficient in terms of the number of the parameters you are using. Second, the log loss, right? You are you have better log loss uh, when you are using DCN, especially when you are using both of them together. Yeah, and our last question is that. What tasks the EBA faces where deep learning and data science are needed? I cannot talk about the EBA or like this bank is or bank is specific, of course. But banking, you might use NLP in deep, which is part based on the deep learning. You might use uh, recommendation systems. You might use uh, data science to for credit risk projects. There is a lot of applications of the machine learning there. Fraud detection is there. A lot of applications. I cannot talk about the e numbers. Yes, thank you. Any so other questions? No problem. Thanks a lot for having me. Uh, in case someone is interested to join data science team in, at eBar, they can contact our HR. Uh, we are they are looking for a data scientists and uh, Python developers for our team there as well. Thanks for eBar from our. Uh, Ibotech Academy to and you guys to for 
having us and providing this support for us. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, guys, we will have 15 minutes break and don't go anywhere. Uh, after this break, we will have a great speaker and he will talk about uh, he will talk about TensorFlow.js and also look at uh, Google and TensorFlow team. So let's meet after 15 minutes.
double gain, plan you in. Today we continue with Jason Mays, who is working at Google. So, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Thanks for having me today. It's uh, great to be on the show. So, he will speak about TensorFlow.js and we are waiting for him patiently. So, let's start. Cool. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen in that case. One second. Okay, hopefully everyone can see my screen now. Perfect. All right, so hello everyone. I'm Jason Mays. I am the de de developer advocate for TensorFlow.js here at Google. And today, of course, I'm going to talk to you about how you can get superpowers in TensorFlow.js, which of course is machine learning in the web browser or anywhere JavaScript can run. Now, before we get started today, um, I know that everyone comes from very different backgrounds. Some of you might be new to JavaScript. Some of you might be new to machine learning. So I just want to make sure we're all starting with the same knowledge. And the first thing I want to address is what is all this machine learning, artificial intelligence, and deep learning? Three key words you've probably heard, but what's the difference between these words? So first thing, artificial, artificial intelligence, or AI for short, is essentially the science of making things smart. Or more formally, this is human intelligence exhibited by machines. But this is actually a very broad term. And right now, we're in a scope of where we make programs using narrow AI. And all that means is that the system can do one or a few things as well or better than a human expert could do in that area. For example, recognizing objects. And one great example of recognizing objects is in the medical industry, where doctors are trying to understand how to recognize brain tumors in the grainy scans that come back from the medical uh, hardware. Now, in the past, this was relying on the human to look at these scans and try and identify what might be a brain tumor or not. But today, we can use AI systems to help us identify regions that are more likely to have the tumor in. And then the doctor can look at that much faster and give you a faster diagnosis and also a more accurate one, too, potentially. So there's just one example of AI in action. Now, machine learning, on the other hand, or ML for short, is essentially at the implementation level. This is the actual program you can create that can learn to find patterns in the sets of data that you present to it. And the key thing here is that this allows you to achieve the artificial intelligence we just spoke about on the previous slide. And these systems can be reused. Uh, so if I make a system that can recognize cats, I can use the same set of code without any, writing any new code to then recognize dogs just by changing the training data that I present to it. And that is very, very powerful. Now, if we go back to the old days, you might remember traditional programming. If we're trying to make a spam filter for email classification, you may have seen something like this in the top right of the slide, where you have lots of conditional if statements. If the email contains a certain word, it's a spam email. If it contains a different word, it's a spam email, and so on and so forth. Now, this is really hard to maintain because eventually the programmer, uh, sorry, the spammer realizes that they can just change the word slightly and get around the system. And of course, there's a battle between programmer and spammer, not a very good use of time. If we fast forward to today, we now use machine learning to do this for us automatically. And people like yourselves will be clicking on the spam email button in Gmail. And you can then, we can then use those emails to automatically train the system to learn what words and phrases are most likely to indicate it's a spam email. So we're using statistics and mathematics to automatically figure out what the words are. And that means the human doesn't need to worry about maintaining the list. We can just run this every night automatically, and the machine can figure out what is more likely to be spam. And it sometimes finds patterns that even we wouldn't have realized were combinations. And you can see there's many different types of machine learning use cases on this slide. Things like uh, vision, such as object detection that we spoke about previously. Numerical regression, which is simply for some input number, can we predict some output number? So for example, if the square footage of a house is 1,000 square feet, what do we predict for price to be? Maybe it's a, a, a million dollars in San Francisco. Um, or how about audio recognition? Any of you who are using mobile phones right now uh, have the smart digital assistants on there. They're using machine learning in order to understand speech. And then linked to that, of course, we've got natural language. 
uh, things like text toxicity and sentiment analysis. And these are machine learning programs that allow you to understand human language itself. And then my personal favorite is generative. This is things like star transfer and creative applications. And one example of this is on the slide right now. You can see these faces here on the right-hand side of the screen. This is actually research from NVIDIA. And the key thing to understand here is that none of these faces actually exist in the real world. They've been dreamt up by the machine learning program. Just like if I asked you to think about a purple cat right now, even though you've never seen a purple cat, you can imagine what one might look like. You know the essence of what a cat is. And the same thing is happening here. The machine learning is not the essence of a human face, in this case, celebrities, hence they all look very celebrity-like. Um, and it's now generating new ones uh, based on its assumptions of what a human face consists of. Now, deep learning, or DL on the other hand, is simply a technique for implementing machine learning that we spoke about on the previous slide. So you can think of this as one of the algorithms you can choose to use in your machine learning program, the actual implementation that was on the previous slide. And there's many other techniques you might want to use, but this is deep learning is, 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 illustrated, uh, sorry, is illustrated here on this slide. <laughs> now, essentially, uh, one such popular technique is known as deep neural networks. And this is where the code structures are essentially arranged in layers that loosely mimic how we believe the human brain to work essentially learning patterns of patterns to give high dimension, high dimension reality that allows you to have these kind of more, you know, high level layers that can represent um, more complex patterns uh, in the image or whatever it is that you're trying to classify. So in summary here, you can see how these three terms are actually interlinked. You've got the deep learning that is the algorithm you can use in your machine learning implementation. And this machine learning implementation hopefully then can give us this grand illusion of artificial intelligence. And the thing to note here is that these concepts actually go back quite some time, back to the 1950s, in fact. But it's only now that we've got the processing power and the resources available at cheap enough cost to make these ideas feasible with all the data that we now have available to us. Now, the next logical question is, you know, how can we train these machine learning systems? And to understand this, I'm going to pretend that we're all a bunch of farmers <laughs> and we're trying to classify apples and oranges, okay? Now, the first thing you need to do is identify features and attributes that you can measure and can represent numerically somehow. So you might choose weight and color to uh, help you classify apples and oranges. And uh, we can see weight can be measured by digital weighing scales and color could just be an RGB web camera, just like you have uh, on your laptops. Now, if you go back to your high school mathematics and you take a sampling of uh, many hundreds of apples and oranges, you might get a scatter plot like this. And you have color on the X axis and weight on the Y axis. And you can see here, the green apples are kind of clustered together in the green spectrum. The red apples are clustered together in the red spectrum. And the oranges here are in the orange spectrum, but they're slightly higher up because they're more juicy. They have more water content inside of them. So on average, their weight is a little bit higher. So now if we can draw a line that separates the oranges from the apples, we can say for any future piece of fruit that we measure, if it is above the line, it's probably going to be an orange. If it's below the line, it's probably going to be an apple. And of course, there'll be some outliers that don't fit perfectly, but most of the time you'd be correct. And this is the essence of what's going on behind the scenes in machine learning. This is a very simplified view of that, of course, but you know, if you can make a computer program figure out the equation of this line for you automatically, then you can make a program that can learn from the data you presented to it. And that's what's going on in machine learning. It's trying to figure out the best way to separate the data so for a future piece of information, we can best have chance of classifying it. Now, it's not always obvious what features and attributes you might want to choose. So let's pretend we choose ripeness and number of seeds. You might have a scatter plot like this for your apples and oranges. And in this case, there's no easy way to separate the data with a straight line or even a curved line for that matter. And you might be, well, Jason, why would you choose such bad features and attributes? Obviously, that's a bad idea right now for doing apples and oranges. It's just not going to work. And sure, for this simple example, it's quite clear that won't work well. However, how about for those more complex examples like brain tumors, where you're, you've just got image data as your input? What features and attributes do you use then? 
things get much harder with more complex examples. And what about higher dimensionality? So currently we had just two features, which means we could draw everything on a 2D graph. Let's pretend we had three features. So you can see here, we've got the ripeness, we've got the number of seeds, and now we're using the weight in the third dimension here to then separate them uh, in 3D instead. So you can see here, we can now separate these apples and oranges using this rectangle in 3D space, or a plane, if you will. And you can see that these oranges are now behind the plane and all the apples are in front of it. So you use the weight of these fruits to separate them uh, and able to classify them again. Now, the key thing to note here is that in machine learning, even three dimensions is not enough. Typically, you work in the realm of tens, hundreds, even thousands or millions of dimensions. And our human brains can't visualize this, but the mathematics actually works out exactly the same. And instead of using a plane, as you can see here, this rectangle in 3D space, you use something called a hyperplane to separate the data. And that just simply means it's one dimension less than the number of dimensions that you have. So what do I mean by that? Well, you can see here that we've got three dimensions and we use this 2D rectangle to separate the data. So the same principle applies in higher dimensions as well. So it should be easy, right? We've got dogs, we've got mops. They're kind of completely different objects. We should be easy to classify. Well, it turns out that some dogs look like mops and vice versa. And even as a human, I struggle to see on this page, which is which. And the reason I bring this up is that you need to be aware of bias in your training data. In order to have the best chance of classifying something later, you need you know, tens of thousands of images that are representative of that thing in all the different situations you might find it in, like the dog and mops you just saw. Now, imagine you want to recognize cats. You might need 10,000 examples of different types of cats, different breeds, different stages of a life cycle, kitten versus adult cat, uh, different fur colors taken from different angles in different lighting conditions on different types of cameras and in different environments, indoors or outdoors, in order to understand what the essence of a cat pixel uh, really is. <laughs> um, and the other thing to point out here is that data is not always images. It could be tables of data, it could be sensor recordings, sound samples, and much, much more. I use images in my slides because obviously it's more visual, but it could be anything. So the next question becomes, why do you want to do machine learning in JavaScript? And essentially that allows you to use machine learning anywhere JavaScript can run. And currently that's pretty much everywhere. We've got the web browser, server side, desktop native, mobile native, and even internet of things. And if we dive into each one of those stacks, you can see many of the technologies you might already be using. So all the common web browsers on the left-hand side there, node.js for the server side, React Native for mobile native applications, Electron for desktop native applications, and even Raspberry Pi is supported because you can run Node.js on Raspberry Pi and you can then run on IoT. And with TensorFlow.js, you can run, you can retrain via transfer learning or write your own machine learning models completely from scratch if you choose to do so, just like you might be doing in Python, except in JavaScript. And this means you can make up anything you might dream up from augmented reality to sound recognition to sentiment analysis, conversational AI, and much, much more. And there's several different ways you can use TensorFlow.js based on your experience of JavaScript or your experience of machine learning. I'm going to go through a, through a few of those today. Now, the first one is to use our pre-trained models. These are really easy to use JavaScript classes for many common use cases that you can use out of the box in just a few lines of JavaScript code. And we've got several of these, as you can see on the slide, things like object detection, body segmentation, pose estimation. Um, and for those of you who are new to these areas, like body segmentation allows you to identify all the pixels in an image that belong to a human body. Uh, the pose estimation allows you to identify the pose, like where the skeleton is. And we've even got some newer models that can do similar things for the face and the hands. And even the latest research in nat for natural language processing, the BERT model has been ported to JavaScript too and can run entirely in the browser to do some very advanced natural language processing. You can see all of these models and many more on tensorflow.org forward slash JS forward slash models. So I, I encourage you to check those out after the show. But today we're gonna see three of them in action. So the first one I want to show you is object recognition. This is known as Coco SSD. Uh, it's just a fancy name for the architecture that it's using, but essentially it allows you to recognize objects. And this one has been pre-trained to recognize 90 object classes out of the box. 
common objects like dogs, cats, humans, beds, chairs, things you might find in everyday life. And essentially you can see here that we can now classify the dogs in the image on the right hand side. And because this is object detection, we can actually understand where the bounding box of each object is, which then also allows us to know how many of the objects are in the image. This is different from image, image classification, which allows you to know there's a dog in the image, but it won't tell you how many or where. It just knows somewhere there is a dog, whereas object recognition tells you where and how many, which is slightly more powerful. So let's see a demo of this in action. So if I bring over my other screen here, one second, there we go. Um, this is running on glitch.com. You can find all of these examples on glitch.com after the show. But essentially, I've made some, um, some code here to allow me to run the object detection model live in the web browser. So if I can click on any of these images, you can see me getting real-time classifications coming back uh, right here. You can see how easy it is here to recognize the dog and the bowl of treats. Um, so you could very easily make a smart web camera to detect when your dog is near the bowl of treats or the, the sofa or the bed or something like this. And then using the power of the web sockets and other web technologies, you could send yourself an alert instantaneously and you can make your own smart camera for free. Um, so very, very powerful stuff. And on the subject of smart cameras, of course, this runs in real time like so. And you can see me talking to you live here today uh, in, in the webcam as well. And the important thing to note here is that uh, this is all running entirely in the web browser on the client side in JavaScript. So that's really important because that means none of these images are being sent to the server for classification. And that protects my privacy. None of these images are being sent to another machine to be classified. So you know it can't be hacked. It's just running locally. Um, so that's very, very powerful and very important if you're going to be running like medical applications or something that might involve user privacy. So that's Coco SSD, and you can see how it works in real time in the browser. Very nice. So going back to the slides, one moment whilst I change my screens here. So next one I want to talk about is face mesh. This is just three megabytes in size, and it can recognize 468 facial landmarks, as you can see on the left-hand side in the animation. And it's actually come a long way since the animation was produced. We can now also do iris detection and have more robust detection at extreme angles. But we're starting to see people use this in business applications already. And on the right-hand side, you can see Modiface, who's part of a L'Oreal group, use it for augmented reality makeup try-on. And the key thing to note here is that the lady on the right-hand side is not wearing any lipstick. We're using face mesh combined with WebGL shaders in JavaScript to render realistically lipstick onto her lips. And she can change the shade using the colored circles at the bottom and now she's able to try the cosmetics before she even leaves her house and goes to the shops, which in today's world with COVID, it means a lot of us are stuck at home and can't go to the shops anymore. So this is a great way to be able to try before you buy uh, in the current times. And just to show you face mesh in action right now, let me switch to another demo. And one moment, whoops, there we go. Here you can see face mesh running live in my web browser as I'm talking to you today. And on the left-hand side, you can see the machine learning classifying my face very robustly. This is the new model. And you can see as I move my face left to right, it's very robust in tracking my face. And because this is JavaScript, not only are we doing the machine learning on the left here, we've also got real-time 3D cloud point estimation going on here, which allows me to render this beautiful 3D graphics at the same time. And even whilst I'm doing all of that and live streaming to you today here on YouTube, I'm still getting a solid 28 frames per second or something like that in the top left there. Um, so that's really powerful stuff. If I wasn't live streaming, that frames per second would jump up even higher. Now, the other thing to note is that currently I'm running on WebGL, which means I'm running this machine learning model on the graphics card of my machine. If I switch the WebGL dropdown to WASM, which is WebAssembly, that means the execution will now run on the CPU. And you can see here, the frames per second has come down a little bit because the CPU is not quite as powerful, but it can still run. So if you needed to use your graphics card for something else, such as uh, rendering a game engine or something like this, then um, you can do so, and then you can push the machine learning to run on the CPU. Um, so it's completely up to you how you want to run these machine learning models. OK, back to the presentation, one moment. 
The third one I want to show you today is body segmentation. This allows you to distinguish 24 body areas across multiple bodies in real time. And we can see example of that on the right hand side here. The different colors represent the different body parts. And you can even see we have pose estimation happening at the same time. Those blue lines contained within the bodies that allow you to know where the skeleton might be too. And we've seen people use this in a variety of different use cases for uh, pose recognition, for workouts, or even healthcare to understand, uh, you know, for fitness instructors, that kind of stuff to count the rep repetitions and all that kind of thing. So it, it's really up to you how you want to use this data and turn it into something very creative. And with a little bit of creativity, you can actually turn uh, these common models that we've just seen into superpowers that we were promised in the sci-fi movies. So here's something I made in just one day of coding. I made an invisibility cloak. And you can see here how I'm using body pics to remove myself from the image in real time. And on the right hand side, you can see the resulting image that I produce. And note, as I get on the bed, the bed still deforms on the right hand side. And it gives you this kind of ghostly Harry Potter style effect as I walk around the room. You know, it's not perfect. You see my arm appear every once in a while. But remember, I made this in just one day of coding using a pre-made model. And that's really, really powerful stuff. If you try and do this in other languages, it might take you a lot longer to get started to start rendering all this stuff and making a nice user interface. Um, so very, very, very cool. And on that subject, what about lasers? <laughs> uh, someone here has used TensorFlow.js face mesh with um, WebGL shaders in order to create this kind of laser show, uh, shooting lasers from his eyes and mouth. You can see how this could be used in some creative application for maybe a movie client for a new movie. Maybe you want to get fans excited about some superhero and you can allow them to become the superhero live in your web browser. No application needed to be installed and they can just have a lot of fun with that in some marketing campaign. Or what about teleportation? I don't know about you, but in the COVID times, I found it very frustrating not being able to speak and meet with people in real life. And I, I'm from England originally, but currently based over in the States. And I decided to make this teleportation example that allows me to segment my body from my bedroom in real time. I can then transmit just for segmentation to a mobile device somewhere else in the world, i.e. my mother back at home. And then she can place me in the room as if I really was there to see and hear me from the correct direction as she's moving around. And this just creates a much more personal experience rather than me being in a rectangular box. Maybe in a future presentation, I'll be coming to you like this. And of course, in the future, when AR glasses are more commonplace as well, you wouldn't even need a mobile phone. You could just summon Jason to be in front of you, and I could appear in front of you with your AR glasses instead of having to use a mobile phone and holding it with your hands. So, you know, super a uh, uh, great amount of potential here. And again, all of this is running in JavaScript in the web browser, no native applications required. Um, and here's some other useful cases, not just superpowers, of course. Here's something I created that allows me to estimate, estimate my clothing size at the point of checkout on the website as you're about to buy the clothes. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm really terrible at knowing what clothing size I am. I buy my clothes like once a year, <laughs> and essentially, uh, I never remember what size I am. So here, I can enter my height. I stand once to the front. It takes my measurements. I take. I stand once to the right, uh, the side. It takes my measurement again, and it's able to then estimate um, what size I am for my chest and waist and all the key measurements you need to then determine if I'm a small, medium, or large t-shirt size at the end. And now that's really good because I can spend less time thinking about this stuff uh, and I get the clothes that I want that is gonna fit me well. And of course the business doesn't have to pay for returns, which means they save a lot of money as well. So a win-win, especially in the current times where people can't go to clothing stores as often. And if we can see what other people in the community have made as well, this guy has also done something similar by uh, scanning magazines. He can take the body he finds in the magazine and bring it to life in the room in front of him using this cool 3D particular effect. And you know, this is really awesome stuff. This is actually running on, I think, a two or three year old Android tablet, and it works very, very well. And again, this is using WebXR, WebGL, and TensorFlow.js combined. So do remember, you can use other web technologies that exist that are already very powerful to create these beautiful experiences. Now, the other way to use TensorFlow.js is via transfer learning. And this is essentially where you retrain existing models to work with your own custom data, because our existing models won't recognize everything out of the box, of course, and you might need to tweak them slightly. Now, of course, if you are a machine learning expert, 
You can do this in code, uh, in, in TensorFlow.js code, but today I'm gonna show you two easier ways to do this for, for image recognition at least. Now the first way is to use something called Teachable Machine. This is a website we produced with uh, one of our teams at Google, uh, the Creative Lab, and essentially um, it allows you to do three things. You can recognize images, audio, or poses, and it allows you to train these. So let's see this in action, and that's the best way to explain how it works. And this is great for prototyping. So if you go to teachablemachine.withgoogle.com forward slash train, you'll see these three options pop up. Today, we're gonna to do images, so let's click on image project. And the first thing we need to do is enter a more meaningful name for what we're gonna to recognize today. I'm gonna to call the first class Jason, which is my name. I'm gonna recognize my face. And the second class, cards, which is a deck of playing cards that I've got in my room. Now we click on webcam and we allow access to the webcam in our web browser. And you should see a live um, uh, version of the webcam on the left-hand side there. I can now, one moment, let me readjust myself here. I can click this blue hold to record button to get a few frames of my face. And I want to take different examples of my face. I'm gonna move my face from left to right, get some variations. Let's just do that one second. Cool. So I move my head around. I've got like 35 images of my face. Uh, it's not much data, but it's something, and that should be good enough for this demo. And now we're gonna do the same thing for the deck of playing cards down below. But instead of my face, I'm gonna use this deck of playing cards. And I want to get roughly the same number of images so there's no bias in my training data, because if I have more images in one, it might be more statistically biased to think and predict that more often. So we wanna try and get roughly the same number, so around 35. Okay, oh, bang on, perfect. So 35 images right there. And now we can click on train model in the middle. And now what's gonna happen, just like we learned at the beginning of this presentation, it's gonna try and figure out the best way to separate this new data that we've presented it. And you can see in under 30 seconds, it's already finished. And we've now got a live preview of the new model it's produced that is uh, predicting JSON as the output, because right now JSON is in the live preview. And if I change this to the deck of cards, you can see the confidence go to cards. So Jason, whoops, one second, I'll get that out of view completely. J uh, cards, Jason, cards, Jason. You can see how fast that is as well, right? Beautiful. So in just a matter of two minutes, we've managed to make a custom machine learning model that can recognize any object you want, at least for the purpose of a prototype. This is not robust enough to deploy into production. You'd want much more training data. Maybe you want tens of thousands of images to train on for a real world production system. But for the purposes of producing a prototype, maybe to get investment for your startup or whatever it is you're trying to do, it might be good enough to show that this could work. Um, so if you're happy with the model you've produced, you can click on export model at the top there, click on download, and you can now save the model files along with this resulting code to then use that model that you've saved uh, on your own website. And with that, of course, you can um, add your own user experience and do something useful with this knowledge of classification. So I've seen people uh, recognize if a garage door is left open and it's dark outside, then they can automatically tell the garage door to close because you know with a Raspberry Pi and some internet connectivity, you can just send a signal to that device to then close the garage door. So you know, it's really up to you what you want to make with this stuff. Uh, the only limit is your imagination. So um, do bear that in mind. Oh, let me go back to the slides here, present. <clears throat> Jolly good. Now, Teachable Machine is great for prototyping, but what about if you want to do something more production quality? Well, you can use Cloud Auto ML for that. And here you can see someone's trying to recognize different types of flowers. And they've got basically thousands of images, gigabytes of images that they've uploaded to cloud uh, storage. And then they've imported it here to the Google Cloud Auto ML system. And you can see all the results here. You then click on next and you can then do, um, optimize your models with the higher accuracy or have faster prediction time. So you can select a trade-off between one of the two or have something in the middle. You then set a budget and you wait for it to kind of churn away on your data and it'll come back to you with the best model it can produce. Once it's finished, you can export to TensorFlow.js as you can see here as an export option. And that will give you the model.json file that you need to run in the web browser. So you just host that on your content delivery network or your web server and once you've downloaded it, simple as that. And you might be wondering, well, how hard is it to actually code um, the usage of this model that we've produced? Uh, actually, it's really, really easy. 
In fact, it's so easy if it's on one slide. So this is the code you need to use that production quality model you just produced on the previous slide. Let's walk through this. So at the top, we import TensorFlow.js. Uh, the second line imports AutoML. And then on the third line here, we've just got a new image we want to classify. In this case, it's just a daisy.jpg from somewhere on the internet. It could be anything. This is a new image it's never seen before, basically. And we've given this an ID of daisy here in the DOM. And then down in our script tag here, which is actually the JavaScript code we're going to run, it's just we've got this function, an asynchronous function called run. It's got three lines of code within it. The first line is await tf.automl.load image classification. And we pass to that the model.json file we downloaded on the previous slide. So hopefully that's just hosted somewhere on your web server. And we have to use the await keyword here because this is an a asynchronous call. The model.json file might be a couple of megabytes in size, so it might take a few seconds to download. So that's why we need to use the await keyword to tell JavaScript to wait for that to finish before we continue execution. But when it is finished, it's going to assign it to this constant called model. Um, we're now going to get a reference to document.getElementById daisy to grab a reference to the image we want to classify, which is above here. And we're going to store that in a constant called image. And then in the final line of code, we call await model.classify and pass it the image we want to classify. And again, this is an asynchronous operation because model.classify might take a few milliseconds to execute. And of course, to a computer, that is a, a million years. So basically, um, you need to use await here. And then you'll get a JSON object returned to this predictions constant, which you can then iterate through and do with as you wish. So the other thing to note is that once you've already loaded the model, you can call model.classify as many times as you wish. You don't need to keep reloading the model. And that's how we get the real-time performance that you saw in the Cocoa SSD example at the, big, at the beginning of the presentation. So you can just call model.classify with different images, and it will be coming back very, very quickly. And now the third way to use TensorFlow.js is to write your own code, of course. And you know, the scope of that is beyond this 30-minute presentation, but I'm going to concentrate on the superpowers and performance benefits you can achieve if you are writing in JavaScript. Now, just to give you a flavor, we've got two APIs in JavaScript. You've got the high-level Layers API, which is very similar to Keras if you're already writing stuff in Python. In fact, you'll, be, you'll feel very at home with the Layers API if, you, if you're used to Keras. And then we've also got the low-level Ops API, which is a more mathematical lower-level API that allows you to change the linear algebra and all this kind of stuff that you might want to fiddle with. So if you are more advanced, you can use the lower-level API too. You can see this, our pre-made models sit on top of the Layers API. The Layers API sits on top of the Core API. And then this understands how to execute in different environments, such as the client side. And by client side, I mean things like the web browser. Now, this environment then understands how to execute on different backends. And by backends, I mean the hardware. So you can see here that TensorFlow.js on the client side supports the CPU, which is the, the, the processor or WebGL, which allows us to leverage the graphics card, or WASM, which is WebAssembly, which allows us to run even faster on the CPU using lower level instructions that are now available to us in JavaScript. And the flip side of this is also true. On the server side, we can achieve the same thing using Node.js. And remember, server here can mean uh, a web server, but it can also mean things like Internet of Things, like a Raspberry Pi, because Node.js can run on Raspberry Pis too. Um, and this one has the same bindings as TensorFlow Python does to the CPU and GPU. And that means you get the same AVX support or CUDA acceleration on the GPU as you would do in Python. In fact, the inference times for TensorFlow Python and TensorFlow.js are exactly the same when you run a saved model through either of those. And as we'll see in the next few slides, it can actually be faster in Node.js uh, with certain caveats. Now, the other thing to note is if you continue on, if you want to continue deploying your ML models in Python, that's completely fine. Uh, however, you can import them to TensorFlow.js. Uh, if you've got a saved KRS model or a TensorFlow saved model, you can load it in via our appropriate API above. And no conversion is required if you're wanting to execute that in Node.js. So if you're on the server side, you can take a saved model and execute it with no conversion. Uh, it'll, it'll just work perfectly fine. Because remember, Node and Python are using the same um, uh, C++ APIs behind the scenes here. Now, if you want to run a saved model on the client side, so in the web browser, not on the server side, then you can use our TensorFlow.js com command line converter. And that will allow you to convert the saved model to the 
um, model.json format we need to run in the web browser. And depending on if you're using exotic operations or not, um, some of them will convert, some of them will not. Most of them probably will. Uh, I've actually put a tutorial on codelabs.google.com. Um, if you search for TensorFlow.js, you'll find the converter tutorial on there, which walks you through how to do that. So let's look at performance then. Um, here is an example from MobileNet v2, which is image classification. And running on the graphics card in Python, we can see the inference is 7.98 milliseconds. And running on the graphics card um, in Node.js is 8.81. So this is less than one millisecond of difference, and honestly, is within margin of error, depending what the server might have been doing when we're taking these recordings. And the key thing to note here is that you've got a lot of pre or post processing. And for those of you new to um, machine learning, pre or post processing is just the, um, the processing you need to do to get the input data into a format that the machine learning model can digest. So remember, everything has to be numerical when it goes into the ML model. Um, maybe you've got an image, Maybe you need to resize it first to make it smaller. Maybe you need to make it black and white to have just numbers from 0 to 255. And maybe you then need to normalize those numbers to be between 0 and 1 for some reason. So this is known as pre-processing. Now, if you convert all that pre-processing to be written in Node.js and not Python, you then get the benefits of a just-in-time compiler of JavaScript at runtime, which can give you significant performance benefits over Python, as you can see on this slide. Now, Hugging Face, who are very, very famous for natural language processing, converted their distillbert implementation into Node.js by converting that pre and post processing to Node. And they saw a two times performance boost over the Python equivalent. So if you are interested in performance and speed, you might want to consider running your Python saved model in Node.js and just convert your pre and post processing to Node to get even better results um, due to the adjusting time compiler of JavaScript. Now, looking to the superpowers here, on the client side, so in the web browser, here's five superpowers that are hard or impossible to achieve on the server side. The first one is privacy. Because you're executing entirely in the web browser, it means that none of the data is being sent to a server. And that's very important for healthcare or legal applications or in countries where you have very strict rules like GDPR in Europe. And second point, lower latency. If you don't need to talk to a server, then of course, there's no round trip time from the client to the server and back again in order to get the classification. It can be done on device instantaneously, which leads to the third point, lower cost. If you don't need to have machine learning servers running 24 seven, if you have a popular website that can save you tens of thousands of dollars per month because you don't need to hire expensive GPUs, lots of RAM and CPUs that are running all the time. And then the fourth point, interactivity. JavaScript from day one, has been about the presentation and display of information. And therefore, our libraries for 2D graphics, 3D graphics, and even um, data visualization are much, much, much more, more mature than other languages out there right now. So you can make things in days instead of weeks or months. And then the fifth point is the reach and scale of the web. Um, currently, we can deploy anywhere on a web page. And that means anyone anywhere can just go to a web page and enjoy the machine learning for free. This is not the true if you're trying to get someone to run this on the back end to try your model out. If you're a Python or Node.js developer and running on the server side, someone is going to have to, first of all, install Linux. Then they're going to install um, uh, the TensorFlow.js or TensorFlow Core. They then have to clone your GitHub repository. They have to read the readme. Uh, they have to set up the CUDA drivers to get graphics card acceleration, which is not easy to do. And then if all of that works out, Maybe, just maybe, they get to run your ML model. So very different um, in terms of barrier to entry versus just pointing someone to a web page and say, hey, check out my model. And that means it's highly shareable, and more people might actually end up using it. Now, if we switch to the server side, there's several benefits of why you might want to run on the server side, too, with TensorFlow.js. Of course, we can use TensorFlow saved models without conversion, and that's useful um, if you want to run larger models for our uh, not able to fit on the client side, maybe they're gigabytes in size, for example, and they're using cutting edge research from the Python community, you can do all of that on the server side. It also allows you to code in one language. So if you're already using JavaScript, and currently 67% of developers out there use JavaScript as their primary development language, according to the Stack Overflow survey of 2020. So that's a huge number of people. And if you're already using JavaScript, it means you can have better maintainability and, of course, code reuse as well. 
And then the fourth point is the performance optimizations we've seen already. We've got the same C bindings as Python uh, on the back end, which means we can uh, run just as fast or faster with the just-in-time compiler of JavaScript. So I'm going to end here with resources to get started. Uh, if there's one slide you want to bookmark, uh, take a screenshot of this one. This has everything you need to get started with TensorFlow.js. Check out our website and API there at the top. Um, we've also got all, all the models at our, our models link there. And we've just, we've just touched on three models today in the presentation. We've got many, many more for you to try out and get inspired by. Also, check out our GitHub code. We're completely open source, just like the original TensorFlow. And we welcome contributions on our GitHub. And then I've also put together some code pen and glitch examples, some boilerplate code to show you how to get started with the webcam and some basic sensors to use with our pre-made models. So you can get a feel for that. You can clone those live in the web browser. No text editor even required. It's all done completely in, in web browser. And you can have a play of those and uh, make something yourself in minutes. Um, if you want to go deeper, uh, there's one book out right now called Deep Learning with JavaScript that was written by the people on my team. Um, and it's very comprehensive and goes quite detailed. Um, however, there's a new book also coming out by O'Reilly, which is made by someone called Gant Laborde, who is one of our GDs. And I've been the technical reviewer for that book as well. And um, I highly recommend that too. It's about to come out very soon. I think it's available for pre-order on Amazon right now. So those two books are my recommendations. They're very comprehensive. Even if you're new to JavaScript and machine learning, they'll, they'll cover all the basics. So with that, uh, come join the TensorFlow.js community. Um, I can't fit all the amazing demos people have made into one presentation. Here's just a few more on this slide. But if you check out Made with TFJS on Twitter or LinkedIn, you'll find hundreds more uh, things are coming out every single week. And I hope to see some of you in the future there too. Now, some incentive to do this is that if you do use the hashtag Made with TFJS, that allows me to find it. And every uh, three months, I have a show and tell on our TensorFlow YouTube channel to in uh, invite guests to the show to talk about what they've created. Uh, and it's a really fun show. We get to see some amazing things being produced. And maybe you might be on that show in the future. So um, do use the hashtag so we can find it. And of course, at the very least, share it uh, to give you more love. Um, so with that, what will you make? I'll leave you with this final piece of inspiration. This is a guy from Tokyo in Japan. He's actually a dancer by day. But he's managed to use TensorFlow.js to make this really cool hip hop video, as you can see on the slide. And the reason I end with this slide is that machine learning really now is for everyone. It's not just for the academics and engineers out there, but the creatives, the artists, the musicians, everyone else has the chance to use machine learning right now. And I'm really excited to see how TensorFlow.js can enable that for everybody else out there too. So do remember to use the hashtag made with TFGS and feel free to keep in touch with me on Twitter and LinkedIn. I'm at Jason underscore Mays on Twitter and Creative Tech on LinkedIn. So feel free to add me over there. And for now I'll take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Jason. You have a beautiful uh, <laughs> presentation. And just I just want to say, say thanks for being with us and your so informative presentation. No problem. Uh, we have one question and yeah. Thanks a lot, uh, Mr. Jason. We already <laughs> know each other from last year's sem your seminar. So uh, sorry, I'm I, I'm uh, I want to ask some questions sure. regarding to TensorFlow.js. Um, I learned TensorFlow.js from uh, Lawrence Mar Maroney's course in the. It was TensorFlow specializations. I think it yep. was the deployment one. Um, or Sarah, uh, maybe, or something like yeah. this. Yes. Yeah. But like since then, I am normally suffering from uh, about finding some good courses or some lectures regarding to TensorFlow.js. I know I was amazed of how you can use uh, TensorFlow.js, like JavaScript combination of that JavaScript with the TensorFlow. Yeah. And it's most of the time that you, it, as it is in the run, uh, you can run it in real time and you can you run it on the web browser. It, it gives you a lot of uh, improvements regarding to the, like, if, instead of like client uh, server side models. Sure. Uh, like, uh, I have some concerns as well in that, that we, we don't have enough uh, workshops. May, <laughs> yeah. like, sorry, sorry. I'm like, uh, I, I would like to learn more, but I'm always suffering to find more details yeah. about the, how to incorporate those, especially in the NLP side. Like, sorry, even in your slides, I couldn't find like 
You mentioned the distilled pear, which is yeah. a hugging face model, which is yeah. a great model. Uh, but I have some concerns there as well, especially other, in other languages. Let me tell you some information now. Uh, so we don't have bird for Azerbaijani language. We have a lot of it, scholars sure. here yeah. are using TensorFlow, but multilingual bird doesn't give you that enough accuracy. Yeah. Let me put you another way. Like even TensorFlow's uh, API for voice recognition, which is also paid uh, paid one. I'm talking about the real cloud-based one. The accuracy for Azerbaijani language is not good at all. Like we have yeah. some like I have seen some models that there are peop some people trained by themselves. They have better accuracy in the voice recognition ASR. Yeah, uh, uh, just uh, just uh, just, to, just to address that bit, there's a lot of questions there. So, um, so obviously, um, so Bert stuff, for example, obviously that's a different team. Like that's a research team who made that model and to retrain that on a different language would require training data and all this information to be able to retrain that model. So yes, that is technically possible, but someone has to do that work, of course. And and um, this is the thing. So if 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 you find the Python equivalent of that actually uh, available, um, then it would be possible to port that to TensorFlow.js in the same way that we've already done it already. We just need mm -hmm. to like redo that pipeline, so to speak. Yes. Um, so if you find that one available in Python or anywhere else in the ecosystem, then you know, let me know and I can, I can look into getting that like, uh, pushed out, <laughs> um, definitely. Yeah. Um, but yes, that is, is a training data thing, unfortunately. And like, uh, it, it takes a lot of time and money to get the training data for every single language out there too. So, right. um, yeah, it, it's, it needs to be a community thing. It can't be just myself doing this for every model out there. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. I'm yeah. telling you, uh, you know, because like, even like we have this still per uh, the inter using that we have uh, in other languages a little bit limited yeah. let's yeah. say also the i have another question here like bert and the several models we have in nlp or just you you, you showed us uh, uh, several other models in like face mesh and stuff yeah uh, or can we use them in the production as well can like can a startup can use them is there any copyright problem there or not? Like, so as, it, as, as I mentioned, face mesh is already being used by L'Oreal for the um, AR makeup try on. So yes, p b these are you know released uh, publicly really? for people to use. The exact licenses are uh, on the GitHub page uh, that we've released it on. You can see the license information there. I think typically it's the Apache license it's released under. Um, so very open license, I think. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the exact license for each model is always in the GitHub repository for that model. So you should be able to find it for that. Yeah. Perfect. Um, is it is there any possibility of for next event, we have some more of the uh, your team helping us about the, like, reviewing some of any cases, like let's say face mesh or you just show, show us teleporting, which is great. I mean, most of them are great, very interesting. Can we have some, like, if we have some hackathon here, or can we have some, like, or uh, let's say some more events uh, and workshops from your team to help us to understand the coding side as well? So, yes. people, I, learn, uh, yeah. people learn how to code that as well themselves. I see, I, I know a lot of JavaScript developers in, in Azerbaijan and in Turkey as well. Yeah. But most of our most of those developers are not familiar with the TensorFlow part, you know, or sure, are not sure. experts. So so for those two things, I highly recommend, sorry, one second. So basically I highly recommend if you want to learn how to do this, uh, we've got code labs at codelab.google.com that show you from zero to hero. Like I show you how to make a smart webcam from like very basics. I walk you through every single step of that um, to show you how to use a pre-made model. There's more advanced code labs that show you how to like make a, uh, a, a, a something very, like a, a model from scratch. Um, like a linear classifier or something like this, uh, linear regression, sorry, that kind of stuff. Um, and it, depending on your level, you can choose and mix what you want. Now to go deeper, the two books that I mentioned, especially the one that's coming out by Gant Laborde is actually like really the best one I've seen so far <laughs> come out in terms of resource. And do remember as well that TensorFlow.js has only been around for like three years. <laughs> and um, uh, I'm the only public face for it right now at Google. Uh, there's only one developer advocate for TensorFlow.js at Google, but that is me. <laughs> uh, and the team who are software engineers are working on the core product, just trying to keep the updates coming out for that. So we've got very limited capacity to 
produce more material than that, which is why I would love to see more people from the community uh, getting involved, um, sh showing events like this um, for the things that they've made. And that's why I've tried to start the show and tells on our YouTube to try and get the faces of these people out there and get people some visibility uh, who are doing cool things. And uh, you know, hopefully they'll become the educators of tomorrow as well. So I think it's going to be a community thing. This is an open source project. It's, it's built by the community as well. And we do need people from around the world to convert these things into their own languages as well. I, 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 I unfortunately only speak English myself. So even that is a limitation in some ways, right? So we need to have like uh, more people out there. I've actually started a working group for TensorFlow.js. So for people who are very passionate about it and would like to get involved in spreading the love, uh, reach out to me on Twitter and LinkedIn. And uh, this is a monthly meeting where we try and figure out these things on, on like how we can and reach and scale to more people across the world and to try and identify presenters who might be cool to, to have at certain events in your regions and that kind of stuff. So um, please reach out to me on Twitter and LinkedIn if you want to get involved in that. Mm -hmm. That's that's great. So yeah. like we want your promises as well, like to like uh, to teach more people in uh, like English is not a problem barrier here in sure. Azerbaijan. A lot of people know English. Yeah. I'm, I'm surprised myself. I'm a guest here as well, but I'm surprised <laughs> as well. Like a lot of young generations, they know English. They are good developers, but uh, bringing JavaScript, TensorFlow JavaScript. Uh, for them, it will be make a lot of differences. I I know by myself, Python is not a problem here. A lot of people they know machine learning and uh, they yeah. already know those, those deep learning part. But TensorFlow.js, when I'm asking and looking for those guys experts, we are like suffering here. Like, but we want to help them as well. Like in the machine learning deep learning side, we can help people. But TensorFlow.js is also, also there is a, 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 the, the, sure. a, yeah. it's another yeah. language for your, itself that we, we need your support as well. So we, we want you guys, uh, you, we want you guys have more collaboration with us. We will help the community here, yeah. open source and like uh, as well. So yeah, I, as I said, so I, I you know, my role is to help educate people everywhere. So yes. um, if people talk to me on LinkedIn or Twitter and ask me a question, I'll try my best to respond. Of course, I I, I think I get through most requests, but there is only one of me and seven billion people on the on the planet asking for a similar thing. So, um, but yes, I, I I anything that I see coming up often, like okay, I, I is there a tutorial for natural language processing? You know, those things. If I see asked enough, I'll try and focus on making something in that space and then releasing it. In fact, I'm actually working on something for a natural language processing kind of path as well, using our uh, existing. We've got pre-made models that use have a toxicity detection, that kind of stuff. And we've got uh, other models that exist as well. And I'm going to show how to use those um, both in terms of out of the box, but then also like, you know, how do I then retrain that with my custom data? And you know, so this is in in the works and hopefully will come out in a not too distant future. So yeah. thanks a lot. Thanks for having right. mm -hmm. us as in your presentation. Thanks a lot. Cool. No problems. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, both of you. It was so interesting discussion. Uh, so I think we have a question. Uh, <coughs> yeah, oh, yeah. What about mm -hmm. for learning and client? Yeah, what about data from LIDAR for learning and client side of TensorFlow.js? So this is something uh, I personally have not tried. I don't have access to a LIDAR. <laughs> um, but you know, there's no reason why you couldn't make a custom model to take this data uh, and, and uh, you know, classify it. Um, I, I think you might have to be careful with like the upper bounds of how many points you're recording. Like, but you know, we can already do images, and you know, that's millions of pixels already potentially. So, as as long as you are um, on a somewhat reasonably powerful machine, because remember, client side. Every machine is different. If you're running on a latest laptop with big graphics card, then of course you're going to get more frames per second out of that than say a, a smartphone. Um, so you know that's the variable of running on the client side. Um, however, you can also run a Node.js on the server side if you want more consistency, just like you do in the uh, regular days with like Python and stuff. So same kind of thing can happen on the server side. But yes, technically there's no reason why you couldn't classify 3D data in TensorFlow.js. Um, we've got all the same. Uh, you know, lower level structures and algorithms and things that exist. So if you want to make a custom model to do that, then um, it should theoretically be possible. Um, but I don't have the training data. I've never tried this myself, um, but I don't see why not. <laughs> yeah. OK. Thank you for your answers and for your presentation, for your, uh, for everything.
No, no problems. Thanks for having me. Cheers. See you. Yeah, bye bye. Yes, guys, he is our last speaker. So at the end, I want to thank you, a lot of people who are helping uh, to organize this event. Firstly, I want to be, start with our user group and uh, our TensorFlow user group, Azerbaijan organizing team has done more beautiful work. And, and also I, I, I thank you to my International Bank of Azerbaijan, where I'm working. And I thank you to uh, Ibatis Academy and all speakers, or all of you who watch these videos, and I hope it will help you and it was useful. So thank you, and it's end of our broadcast. See you at our next slide, next events.